following is a presentation of the Falcon Media Sports Network, BG Falcon Media, and WBGU 88.1 FM. Welcome, everybody, to the special homecoming week edition of the Zig Zone. I'm Carl Smith, and we're going to be talking BGUS athletics all hour too long, give or take. We'll see how it goes. But I think we have a lot to get into. And we're going to start with football. Reese Patrikas, what do you have up your sleeve for us today? Uh, Harold Fannin, we are all witnesses. (laughs) We can all say we were here when Harold was here. All right, Tyler, you're going to be subbing in a little bit for our man Chaz McNeil, who's going to call in for volleyball. What's going on with our volleyball team? Well, they hit a rough stretch with Ohio State past couple of games. There's still some bright spots, but uh, they need to get out of the rough stretch first. And starting conference play very soon. Lucas, catch us up on men's soccer, please. Number 24 ranked team in the country. Trace Terry and Bennett Painter are feeling it. And we're going to talk about how Henry Costco made that, made that hot take on the top 25. And Henry, um, talk to us about the women's team. Yeah, women well, fresh off of a big 2-1 win, big <clears throat> late winner, which actually ended up being an own goal for Toledo, but... We'll take it. We'll talk all about that later on. Sounds awesome. And Holden, uh, there's something special that's going to happen with this our cross country teams. Catch us up. They're building up to big things. Had a good show in this last weekend without all of their runners, and they're really shaping up nicely. Outstanding. Okay, so we have a lot to cover. We're going to get into all that after a short break. First, I want to remind you what's going on next door at our sister station, Falcon Radio, which you can catch 24-7 streaming at bgfalconmedia.com. It's Smoke Hour all month long. So you still have another week or so to catch all of the country music you can handle. Again, that's at Falcon Radio at bgfalconmedia.com. We'll be back with the Zig Zone right after this. Wake up and get going with the music you know and love on Northwest Ohio's community radio station. Early Bird Oldies broadcasts weekdays from 4 to 6 a.m. and plays all the tunes you remember. Find WBGU on the bottom of the dial on 88.1 FM or streaming worldwide on bgfalconmedia.com. Early Bird Oldies will put a smile on your face and make you tap your feet. And it's only on WBGU Northwest Ohio's community radio station. All right, and that's our Falcon Marching Band rolling us into the first hour of the Zig Zone. And what a great week. It's homecoming week here at Bowling Green State University. There's a lot going on. We're going to jump into some football. Um, first, though, Wyatt, why don't you catch us up for those who I can't imagine anybody missed it, but we are an equal opportunity radio show. So why don't you catch us up on what happened with the football team? Well, you know, in football, BJ gave a really good opportunity um, to win that game against Texas A&M, but they just couldn't hold on, losing 26-20 to there. Um, Harold Fannin Jr., really, he opened up the second half with a career-long 65-yard touchdown reception. Um, Falcons only trailed by 13-10 to there. Um, however, Texas A&M ended up scoring at 20-10 there. Um, and just, just as they seemed to have the game in there, they ended up actually fumbling it towards the end, um, really getting close there uh, as they got closer, but it ended up you know, as we said, getting a loss 26-20. All right, a lot of back and forth. And there were a couple times, Reese, when we thought that, you know, this is going to be a classic big team just, ste- you know, steamrolling Bowling Green. They're going to put it away. Um, Brock Horn with that amazing punch out near the end of the game. Um, to talk to us. Let's start just by talking about the sheer emotion of a game like that. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, kind of a roller coaster. You start out that first half um, – and you just allow Texas A&M to march right down the field on you. And then the offense comes out and sputters a little bit, really until their third drive when they were able to kick that field goal. And, I mean, in the first half, the offense, I feel like it was backwards of what we usually see when we see Bowling Green playing a big game like that, where usually the offense is on in the first half, the defense is a little suspect in the first, and then in the second half they usually flip sides and the offense, or the offense is what kind of begins to sputter. But... 
the offense, the defense was fantastic in the first half. I, I mean, it was a, being able to stop a team like that who is coming off of back to back 300 yard rushing performances. Uh, you were, I mean, um, it was still around six yards per carry that Texas A and M was able to pick up, but it, they didn't feel like it was a 235 yard rushing performance from that we offense. We didn't get dominated, Reese. I mean, that yeah. ain't that. That's the thing when Bowling Green or a team like Bowling Green plays one of these big, big schools. Your biggest concern is always you're just going to get dominated up front. That that did not happen last night. No, and it first off, well. Bowling Green also has some really big boys down mm-hmm. in the trenches, especially on the defensive side. Uh, I think there's two, three, four guys weighing in at over 295 pounds. So the size certainly is there, and it looked like the skill level was there. And Texas A&M was missing a couple starting offensive linemen, so I will I will put that out there. But for the most part, against a Power 5 Division One offensive line, the Bowling Green defensive front held their own in the first half especially. Yeah, yeah. And you did see, uh, for those who watched the game, um, a couple, especially we got into the fourth quarter, guys cramping up, which you know is going to happen in that kind of uh, – that, and that's where the depth of a Texas A&M – that that can overwhelm a team, but uh, we didn't we didn't see Bowling Green roll over. There was never a point in that fourth quarter. You thought we've cashed it in and we gave up. Yeah, there was there was a little bit. I think right before Brockhorn punched that football out, where I was like, okay, it might you know it's hot down in Texas. We mm-hmm. we all know that Texas heat is different. No matter how hot it is here in Ohio, mm-hmm. the Texas heat's just different. I thought it was going to get to a point where it was okay. I think these guys are just going to try and reserve their energy for next week at homecoming. But then. Brockhorn punches the football out, and I think everything kind of changed there. And it didn't look for the la- for that last drive. It didn't look like the heat was really getting to anybody. No, that, that, I would say that that, that you know through the right through that very end, you saw you saw that energy. So you mentioned the offensive line, um, Reese, and we we had to make a substitution and talk about that because that's a you know again you need all your weapons at a game like this. And here we had someone who had to kind of step up. Yeah. So it, early in the game, Nick Reimer, who transferred in from Merrimack in the off season, a 2023 first team All NEC selection. Came in, he'd been doing a really good job, was a big part of the reason why Connor Bazelak hadn't been sacked through mm-hmm. the first uh, two games of the season. He goes down, no update on that, so we're not sure if he'll be back next week. But Billy Roberts came in, who switched, he was a defense, he came here as a defensive tackle mm. um, and switched over to offensive line, I believe, last year. And he did a really good job. He was matched up. I mean, Texas A&M's got two guys or three guys on coming off the edge who are really good, one of them. Being someone, of course, that uh, all of us here in the four one nine are very familiar right. with in Cash Howell, right. and he did a really good job. Most there, um, Connor was only sacked twice, and both of them came from inside. Mm-hmm. So the two guys on the ends, especially Billy, who had to come in in relief, did a really good job. Yeah, and let's not forget, you know, there is a Bowling Green connection in Texas A and with uh, Elko, Mike Elko, um, and yeah, his the 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 pressure that came. Both, I would say this both in the passing game and the running game came from the inside. That's when when our running plays got stuffed, it's because something broke down in the inside. You know, and Elko is so good at those interior blitzes at, at just designing those up, and that's I think that's where we got we got hit. Um, let's talk, Reese. Let's talk about the passing game a little bit. So we talked um, um, part of the frustration of a Connor Bazelak who at times when uh, and I think Tyler mentioned this, he's kind of a rhythm quarterback when he's in rhythm. Really, things can be clicking. But there were two throws in particular that just were kind of teeth. You kind of clenched your jaw really hard. Talk us through what happened with those two plays. Yeah, so I think I'll start with the big one, and that was the interception there towards the end of the mm-hmm. fourth quarter where, I mean, Harold Fannin, he could he probably couldn't have been more open than he was. For, for a guy who even the announcers are saying – there was a, he, they called it a game of where's Waldo. Every play, where's Fannin lined up? And so you know they were looking for him, and he is wide open. Yeah, they still lost. They, he was still lost. Mm-hmm. And then Connor, I'm not sure what happened. Maybe on, if it was he just wasn't able to step into the throw or something or just throwing with some sort of pressure, but he just sailed it, and it was nowhere near Fannin. Ended up getting picked off in the back of the end zone. And then the other one, was a surefire touchdown to Malcolm Johnson running up the middle of the field. And maybe there was a little bit too much on it, but also it was certainly a 
football where Johnson could have put a play. He could have been able to make a play it on it. He was put on the right, the correct was, shoulder because he was looking, he was running a, what looked to be a corner route. He's looking over his right shoulder, which all seems you know, kind of textbook football. But then the ball just, not only was it kind of hung up there a little bit, it was off to the left. So he didn't, that's a ball where you should easily be able to put it in a place where only your guy can make a play on it. Yeah, and that's a former track star in Malcolm Johnson right. who had, he had a corner and a safety covering him, and he had three yards of separation right. between the two of them. Right. And that that should have been a walk-in touchdown, but just th- those were really the two biggest plays mm-hmm. where there was a little bit of a disconnect between Bazelak and his weapons. And can you t- so speaking of that, um, talk a little bit, Reese, about targeting, right? Like who is Bazelak targeting? Because we saw a big disparity last night. Yeah, after after the Penn State game where he was moving the football around and the receivers were getting a lot of looks, only four of his completions, he completed 20 passes last night, only four of them were to wide receivers. Mm-hmm. He Fannin had eight. Of course. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's kind of to be expected mm-hmm. at this point. Jamal Johnson, who's a running back, had five, although he's been playing a little bit of both. Uh, Jason Patterson had two. Uh, and then Jacob Harris also had a catch. So that's 16 out of 20 completions to running backs and Harold Fannin. Um, so I think, not to say that maybe that's why it didn't go so well, but I think one of Texas A&M's weak points is their secondary, especially at the corner, mm-hmm. the cornerback position, because I believe I heard it being mentioned on the broadcast that when um, that new regime got to Texas A&M, there were only two corners on the roster. Wow. So they had to kind of scramble to put together Rebuild a secondary. Yeah. and um, the fact that you weren't able to exploit that weakness is a little concerning. Do you think? Um, do you think part of that was Elko designing defenses to protect his corners? I, I would say that's probably a good bet. Um, mm-hmm. It's pretty well known that Mike Elko is one of the better, if not one mm-hmm. of the best, defensive coaches in college football. So I think, as a smart guy, as the smart guy that he is, I'm sure he was able to scheme his defense to kind of cover up that blemish. Um, but for a guy like Scott Leffler, who is is very highly regarded in, as an offensive coach, you got to be able to w- find a way to uncover that and start taking advantage of that. And get your get the ball in the hands of your playmakers in space, right? To um, to to try and get something done, right? But okay, so speaking of Scott Leffler, let's take a minute because I know on um, the Falcon Forum on Facebook, some somehow. We had people calling for Scott Luffler's head. We had these two close games. We should have won something. Um, I'll let you go first because I'm I'm still kind of dumbfounded by that one. I think that's a little excessive. Um, <laughs> we haven't started conference play yet. It was we've they've lost by 13 combined points to the number eight team and the number 25 team right. in the country. Should we have won at least one of those games? You can make the argument, but I think calling for Leffler's head. After three games, two of them being against two of the top 25 teams in the nation, that's a little bit far when you also consider you've got Old Dominion coming up, who I'm not going to say, I'm not going to give it the jinx, but Old Dominion is a game that you should win. Correct. And then you have Agreed. and then you have Akron, which is a game that you should win. Mm-hmm. Then you have NIU, which is going to be tough, but... It's the MAC. It's, it's, the, MAC it's, it's the MAC, yeah. exactly. And then you've got Kent State, which you, you should, should win. win. So, and then after that is Toledo, which, as the head coach of Bowling Green, that's a game you, you should, have to win. Right, you have right, to win. Exactly, yeah. But, you I, know, so, Reese, um, let's talk specifically about Luffler in this game because there are, you know, a couple of things that make a head scratch, right? Like the, the onside kick, uh, you know, you can, uh, if, you, if it works, you're a genius. And, the, and I'll, as a sidebar, let's give credit to the SEC announcers. Right, we've talked about this because the number of times when we had to listen to that, the, watch the Michigan game last year, and even to degree in the Penn State game, and all you know, it's it, you know, why are we even there? Because it's you know, like a scrimmage. But those announcers, I thought, game, Bowling Green, they're due. And when they showed that replay of the onside kick, the color commentator made the observation that if <clears throat> if it's the right kick and our guy gets it, he's got a lane all the way to the end zone. So I think it's a reasonable gamble. Um, you know, the, the reverse. Brilliant call. I mean, bringing Lucian Anderson in and have you know. So, talk a little bit about um, giving. Let's give Luffler a little, a little love because I think yeah. he deserves some. He, he, he does deserve it in a game like that. I I was really a big fan of that onside kick mm-hmm. call, and I agree with the announcer. I was actually telling Tyler last night. Um, 
if he put if Zach Long puts a little less mustard on that football, Bowling Green recovers that football. Yeah. Maybe they score. Maybe Texas A and M's return units able to catch up to whoever was there on the outside. Yeah. But that was just unfortunate that he put it out of bounds. He put a little bit too much on it. The trick plays when. It was the right trick play at work. We saw the 40-yard reverse yep. to Rakeem Smith and Lucian Anderson, by the way. Yes. Se- beautiful block <laughs> right, there. Right. Beautiful block to Which, spring. Which, again, the announcer said, yeah. look at Anderson. They showed in the replay. Watch again. That's fantastic. Now, granted, do I want my backup quarterback <laughs> right. out there throwing blocks when I have another quarterback who hasn't, been, uh, who hasn't played football yet this season and then another one who hasn't really gotten many snaps at any level right. of college football and Baron May. Do I want my backup quarterback out there throwing blocks? Probably not, but it worked in that situation right. and he didn't get hurt. But then also you have the trick play, like the one um, after after the blocked punt. Mm. I believe it was the second down play where you give it to Pegues and Pegues rolls out to the right and tries to hit yeah. Fannin in the end zone. That one, I think, probably could have been kept in the back pocket for a little bit longer. That one with a short field on both sides because yeah. they were on the right hash there and they had Piggies rolling out to the so right. That, so that is, so this is something that we talked about this before we got on the air, that if you, if you know that's a play you're going to pull out, you have to think ahead. Mm-hmm. And on first down, you run basically a quarterback sweep right. You've got to run the ball to the left just to put on the left hash mark so that Piggies has more room to run because he's not a quarterback by trade. So I think that was one of those ones that's a head scratcher that I think like Scott might have outthought himself a little bit. Yeah, I think so. And that's something that we've seen a couple times. You look, you go back to that Penn State game, and the big one that everyone looks at is that fourth and one play call, mm-hmm. and Scott himself even admitted that, hey, you know, that's I I outthought myself there, right. but. One play call that I wanted, that I would have wanted to see in that situation, we saw it against Fordham, where John Henderson ran a fake punt, mm-hmm. and maybe Texas A and M expects it because we burned, they burned it in Week right. One, but John Henderson was a quarterback in high school, mm-hmm. so maybe it could be time. You know, we'll, we'll look ahead to next week with homecoming yep. crowd. It should be a packed house. Sure, maybe that's a situation and. You know, you're in Texas A&M national spotlight. You pull out a fake punt pass, but I would have liked to see that. Well, speaking of special teams, can we talk about the block punt? Yeah, let's talk about that as um, the kind of you know Scott said something to the effect of you know there's some things we're going to do on special teams that are going to be interesting, and you know we saw the onside kick, but then the block punt. Th- those are incredible momentum changers. Yeah, and that's something that Bowling Green has done time and time mm-hmm. again. It, it was really just a matter of time until they got home. We've seen over the last couple of weeks the block unit getting closer and closer mm-hmm. and closer to blocking one. And it's just unfortunate. It was a great block. It was a great play by Trey Johnson and a great recovery as well. It's just a shame that they, A, weren't able to advance it any further right. than they were, which in that situation where it's a scramble, it's a little hard to pick it yeah. up and run. And also, I feel like coaches also preach, if you, see, if you see the ball on the ground, don't be a hero. Just yes. jump on it and get your team the football yeah. or get your team the football back. But mm-hmm. I just wish that that punt, turned into points because that was just a wasted opportunity yeah that, and that and that definitely hurt i will say just on a again very detailed it wasn't like it was a tip it, he swamped it i mean johnson got there yep. like full bore there was no doubt about that one no it, it there was not a chance in the world that that ball was getting through his, past his hand at yeah all. so um you know again Great plays on both sides of the ball. You know, I think we saw the defense up at the Brockhorn play, but to your point, I think just consistently across four quarters, defense really stepped up. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so here's here's the question, and and uh, let's open it up to everybody here. Um, Do they come out flat against Old Dominion, or will they play like they have against Penn State and A and M and set the tone for MAC play? And I say that. Because last year we had the big game against Michigan. We're riding high off of that thing in the big house. And then in front of what, again, Reese was right, packed house. I expect a packed house this Saturday. And we laid the biggest of eggs I could imagine. What do we expect this weekend? Well, history would say yes, that we will lay an egg. Because that's <laughs> what's happened in the Leffler era is you do good against a team that you shouldn't. And then we end up doing bad against a team that we should good against but 
I'm going to say no, because I think this team's mentality is different from years prior, and I think this team has matured a lot from the previous years under Scott Leffler, and I feel like a lot of the players on the team, especially the veterans, are on the same page in that they want to win a MAC championship at the end of the year. So uh, my quote-unquote expertise opinion, I would say no. I think they will come out intense against Old Dominion and put on a good show in front of homecoming. Okay. I'm also going to say no, because we talk about the Michigan game last year a lot, how it was mm-hmm. close. What was the final score of that? 31-6? to six? Yes. Like, we played it close to the first half. You got blown out. You got boat raced in the second half. Yeah. The difference this year is you've lost, like Reese said, to two of the top 25 teams in the country by less than two touchdowns. So you know you can play with these top teams in the country. And you look at Bowling Green. Bazelak's a senior. Fannin's most likely gone after this year. Mm-hmm. Tarion's a question mark. A Ladokan's gone. You got a lot of pieces on defense going. A big story coming into this season and the offseason was how many people returned. Right. This is their window. So yeah. I, I expect I Leffler to get this team focused on every game in front of them and not looking ahead at anything, which, you know, good note for MAC teams if you look at Northern Illinois and Toledo. Fair. I just want to say that to two things. I have two things. First off, last year. That was that was painful to watch, but also you walked out of Ann Arbor, and the team had ice packs taped to every single it was part an of infirmary. their body. It was, an infirmary, it was right? it, yeah, it was it was, a mass it, was yeah. it was bad. Yeah, this year it's not as bad. You've got Terion, who I don't he didn't look a hundred percent yesterday. I I, I think. Especially He's, in the second half, I thought. I, I, yeah, I think they. I, I think Leffler moving away from him also showed I that think, he did not want to run him in the ground. I, I, I think that's more. and that's why he and that's why he didn't play against Penn State because, like he has said time and time again, when you're not 100 percent against a team like a Texas A&M or a Penn State, you're going to get hurt again. And right, right. he saw that Terion wasn't 100 percent, didn't want to get him rebanged up as we go move into homecoming. But also on the other on the other side of that coin, Old Dominion. Has they're they're coming into this game zero and three, and I'm not going to say that just to put them down. They're also coming off of a bye week, so they're going to have two weeks to, or they're going to have had two weeks mm-hmm. by the time Saturday rolls around to prepare for this Bowling Green team. Now they have tape on, they have three weeks worth of tape on all of the tricks we run, mm-hmm. all of the th- stuff that um, has worked against good teams, and also. They do have some studs. There's, uh, they have a linebacker, Jason Henderson, who he's missed the last two weeks. I'm trying to, I've reached out to people at Old Dominion, haven't heard back, just to see if there's any sort of injury update because mm-hmm. he he got hurt at the end of last season and then played against South Carolina Week One, hasn't been seen since. He's two years removed from a 186 tackle season. Jeez. They've got studs all over. Their quarterback is pretty all right. He's. 42 of 72, 389 yards, two touchdowns, three picks. Missed last week with an injury, so that could be something to watch. But they, they have a, the running back came from a big school, if memory serves. I did a little research on that as well. So they've that. And speaking of the defense, um, when I was looking over their numbers, their safeties are playmakers, both of them, deflecting passes, tackles for loss, interceptions, fumbles cost. So this is not. Um, uh, this is not a team that you know is coming in just expecting to get steamrolled. To your point, it, if anything, if it, if they're poised to make something happen, you come in zero and three off a of bye week. You have some playmakers. Th- th- we we've got to come to play. And you come in and you want to catch a team that's riding high off yep. of two close games mm-hmm. against ranked opponents. And um, to confirm what you said, Aaron Young, the running back for Old Dominion, spent uh, a couple years at Rutgers. Uh, 20, yeah. 2019 to 2023, he was with Rutgers. But so he has some big game experience. He's, he's not, he's, he's not going to be intimidated by 20,000 people at Doit Perry Stadium. No, he certainly isn't. He's played in the Big Ten from, I won't say coast to coast, because there was no coast to coast <laughs> right, right. in 2023. Well, but from the North Coast. <laughs> yeah, he's from the coast of the Atlantic Ocean to yes. the coast of Lake Michigan, but... Yeah, I don't think it's a I don't think it's a game where you look at zero and three, but I don't think it's an zero and three team. Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. But I think so that so you think we're gonna be ready for this, Reese? You're, I mean, you're you're a football guy. What's your take on that? I, I'm gonna agree with what Lucas and Tyler said mm-hmm. in that this the feel around this team just feels very different. I think everyone is more bought in to not only Coach Leffler. But there's 30-something-odd seniors on this team, which means that there's 30-something-odd leaders on this team. And mm-hmm. I think everyone's kind of bought into the message because there's guys who have seen a lot a lot of success 
uh, maybe not at Bowling Green, but guys who have seen a lot of success elsewhere, and they can they they ha- can bring that winning mentality, and I think they have so far, and we've seen it through the last three weeks. And so to to elevate this a little bit, when you talk about Luffler and you know what is you know hot seat, warm seat, whatever you want to call it, is he ever going to be in a better position to win the MAC? You've got. And I am, you know, I'm on record as not being the biggest Connor Bazelak fan, but he is your guy. He's got experience in the system. You've got an experienced offensive line. You've got one of the best running backs in the Mid American Conference, and Stewart went healthy. You have the best tight end in the country. You have a defense that I think was phenomenal last year and has shown no, like, hasn't missed a step. Um, special teams seem to be doing their thing. I, I don't know what are a better opportunity there is. So. What's it going to take? Is it you know if, if this isn't if it's not now, when like Reese, if we don't win it this year, when are we going to win it? I it, it probably won't be in my time here, and you know, granted, I am a senior. My <laughs> my days here my days here at BGSU are numbered, but I this is the perfect time because yeah. you look around the Mid American Conference and Miami of Ohio has struggled. Mm-hmm. Toledo lost last night to a west uh, to a Western Kentucky team that they should have beaten. Right. NIU just lost to Buffalo, which is a team that they should have beaten. And I think I, I think now is the time. I the Mac isn't rebuilding, but I would say it's retooling. The top the teams that we're used to seeing dominating the conference are retooling a little bit. So I think Bowling Green, who returned most of their talent from last year and a team that fell short, so these guys mm-hmm. are gonna be a little angry, or these guys are angry, they're hungry. I think this is the perfect time to strike. Yeah, I, I'd have to agree. I think this the um, the the window is now. To Tyler's point, like now is the time. And I would submit that that this Old Dominion game is a tone setter. Um, you know, the the cliche is you have to go one and one and zero each week. And when you have a veteran team that knows what the mission is, I, I don't want to say there's no excuse, but I will say there's no excuse to come out flat because coming out flat to me is a that's a that's a coaching staff issue. Mm-hmm. The coach has to get the team to come out hair on fire stomp old dominion you know we need to get up by a couple touchdowns at halftime so that we're not in that you know because that fordham game was a classic example midway through the third quarter we're thinking why is stewart still out there because it's still a game Mm -hmm. that should not be the case this weekend no it shouldn't be you got to come out hot whether you start on offense or defense you start on defense first play of the game bring six why not first play of the game if you're on offense do what you do every time Coach Leffler has a pattern every time that Bowling Green gets the football first in a big game, shot down the field. Mm-hmm. You saw it against Penn State when he when Bazelak hit Fannin down the middle for a big play. You saw it, or you would have seen it against Georgia Tech. He said that if Georgia Tech hadn't run a big play down the middle of the field, he would have done the exact same mm-hmm. thing. This isn't one of those types of games, but this is a game where you have to come out hot. Like you said, hair on fire. Yeah. Why not take a shot to open up, open up the game, set the tone early, set the tone often and you should walk out of there with a multi-touchdown victory yeah this uh, yeah and this is again I, I don't think like a win isn't enough i think this team needs to make a statement and i think that's part of it is proving that we can play that type of game against a team that frankly is below us as far as stature goes you know we did it against the big schools which you you like to see but um we need, you know, we 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 all remember the ghost of Eastern Kentucky two years ago. That you know, we can't get rid of that. Um, we remember them coming out flat against OU. And and I will say, you know, you're you know, you're we talked about the infirmary thing. Like you're you're right. Um, they didn't practice that whole week. That won't happen. There's the, the, I, I, there's no excuse to not come out with your hair on fire, steamroll this team, so that um, you know, Lucian Anderson gets meaningful snaps in the second half, and you're seeing us go down the depth chart to get some playing time for some guys. Yeah, and I know we're getting close to the bottom of the hour, mm-hmm. so I'll end with this. Old Dominion, statistically, one of the worst teams in the Sun Belt Conference. They're, thir- wow. they're 13th out of 14 teams in the Sun Belt in scoring. They, and do you know off the top of your who they've played? Like we know they played South Carolina, which let's face it, formidable opponent for for them. Right. It's a big, it's a big school, but so they uh, South Carolina was their closest game. They lost twenty three nineteen. Then they went and lost East Carolina twenty to fourteen at home, 
and then Virginia Tech came in two weeks ago and stomped them at in Old mm. Dominion. So it's not the easiest schedule in the world, but it's also, I mean, that East Carolina game probably should have been a win, but it's it, it's not like they were playing teams that should have just came in and steamrolled them from the get-go. They They're, didn't play Penn State and Texas they did, A&M. Yeah, they didn't play t- Penn State and Texas A&M. They played teams that they should have been able to put up yards against. Mm-hmm. They averaged 16.7 points a game. They averaged under 300 yards of total offense while allowing over 400 yards of total offense. So the, the recipe is there. This, again... This should be a game that Bowling Green dominates from start to finish. Um, okay, who is anybody here not going to be at that game Saturday? I see. I see one shaking. Tyler, why are you not going to be at this game? I've got some family stuff back home. I have to go to. That's inexcusable, Lucas. I want him fired. Get him out of here. That can't happen. We'll talk right. after. <laughs> be a good be a post show discussion. Um, so I will say this, um, Reese. Thank you. Fantastic stuff for football. Broke it all down. Um, this such a big weekend. This is such a big big week. And I'll remind everybody that you're going to find ongoing football coverage all week long at bgfalconmedia.com. You'll see it on the Falcon, BG Falcon Media socials. Uh, find BG Falcon Media on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, X. Uh, we're, we're, going to, we're going to be on top of this stuff. Um, a lot going on, though. The homecoming week is going to be more than just football. But, uh, and we had a big weekend. Like, we love what happened down at College Station. But we're going to talk next about a volleyball team that made history this weekend and electrified the Falcon fan base and are now heading into Mid-American Conference play against a perennial powerhouse. There's so much going on with that. And, and if we thought their non-conference schedule was tough, just wait till you hear how they're going to start Mid-American Conference play. Um, Tyler Kavlitz is going to talk to us a little bit about that. We're hoping to get our own Chaz McNeil on the phone to dive into this past weekend, and they'll break it all down. Um, but after we come back from the break, I'm going to give Mr. Reese Patrikas a chance to redeem himself Two weeks ago, we had Reese in here, and uh, he got buried. We talked about pizza, and it, it, it didn't go well, Reese, did it? No, it didn't. I got <laughs> I got flamed for – I. It, the saying is that there's no wrong opinion, but apparently my opinion was wrong <laughs> Except on, for yours on the on pizza, pizza Bowling Green. Yeah. So we'll, we'll, we'll see what you got up your okay. sleeve for me, Carl. So we're going to open it up a little bit. Our first round, Robin, okay, outside of the football game. Give us uh, give us a hot take on homecoming weekend outside of football. There's a lot going on at homecoming. I want you to come back and tell us something we should – a hot tip, something to look forward to, whatever. Okay, we're going to get into all of that and a whole lot more uh, after this short break. You're listening to The Zig Zone on WBGU 88.1 FM. Yeah. I'm Anna Sidek. I'm a freshman setter from BJSU volleyball team, and that's my four self-care habits. So the first one is drinking a coffee because it helps me to be just energized like during the day. Second thing would be reading a book. I'm a such bookworm and I just love it. Um, other one would be listening to music because like music keeps me calm and I just love it. And the last thing, but not the least, it would be like starting with Santi, our athletic trainer, because he keeps my body safe and everything, so I'm really grateful for him. The 
24th ranked BGSU men's soccer team looks to make it back-to-back -back Missouri Valley Conference victories when they head to Peoria, Illinois to take on the Bradley Braves on Saturday, September 21st. Check out Falcon Media Sports Network's post-game coverage on bgfalconmedia.com. All right, welcome back. We are here on the Zig Zone, and we're going to uh, – we got we have a lot to cover. We have a lot, lot to cover, and uh, – I want to want to share this before we jump into it because this is a critical part of what we're gonna be talking about. Does anyone remember uh -huh. this classic ditty? Bowling Green, Falcon Team, where my focus at? What is happening? This Carl, is, you might be dating yourself here. This is the Stroh Center rap. You guys, if this is if not heard this, no, I no, I haven't. Wow. Well, when did this come out? Is this real? This, this is the real deal. What year was this? Thought, uh, this is when the show opened about 13 years ago. Wow. Yeah, Carl, I was 8 13 years ago. I wasn't listening to the Stroh Center rap. Man, that's rough. I was watching I, I, was, I was watching Nick Swisher take the Indians playoffs. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Well, uh, we're going to get into our oh round robin, but we have Chaz on the phone, so we're going to we're going to jump right into volleyball. So, Tyler, I'm going to let you kick it off, then we're going to roll Chaz into this. So, um, well, actually, I'm going to go over to Wyatt. <laughs> Wyatt, catch us up on why this was such a great weekend for um, for women's volleyball. So, women's volleyball had a huge showing out um, at the Straw, at least 4,200 fans there. I was there. It was loud. Um, you know, the people screaming, it was going crazy. Um, each set was close, but it ended up being three and one out, um, for BG. Um, so it was a close match there, but ended up losing to OSU there. And then, um, on Sunday today, um, they ended up going out in three sets. Um, Hovey as well, always a highlight, um, with 10 kills, but ended up with, a uh, OSU and Londot with 19 kills and two men with 33 assists. All right. So, um, Tyler, give us a quick take on this and what we saw, what happened. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the we talked about the crowd uh, for mm -hmm. volleyball on Friday, and they played that Ohio State team close, just didn't have enough firepower, it seemed like, to keep up with them, and then it was just a uh, a sweeping today in Columbus. Nah, nothing really close there, but just seemed like uh, they threw everything they had at the start of that Ohio State match, kept tight, but just for some reason, they, and Chaz will talk about this more, mm -hmm. there's just something missing right now at the team, and it's very early on in the season, a lot of new players, but they, they just still need to put a little more together to get this thing to really click. And the clock is running on this team to get it together because we're going to start MAC play, and uh, and and there's not going to be a lot of time to figure the rest out. Okay, Chaz, I hope we're going to hear you here. Chaz, can you hear us? Chaz, I can hear you. All right, we can hear you. You can hear too. So, Chaz, Hi, you were you were down there in Columbus. Um, talk to us. Talk to us about what happened today. Let's let's catch up on that first. Okay. So, as, as it was previously mentioned, it was not the best showing for mm -hmm. Bowling Green against Ohio State. But, and it, it, it is entirely it was entirely a blow from start to finish the Buckeyes dominated that matchup. The Falcons mm -hmm. got trounced in that matchup, and it came predominantly off of the middles. The middles for Bowling Green just were not able to get things done. Wow. Jessica Andrews, Alexis Mattel, they were not able to shut things down. And, 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 that, and Chaz, they, Mattel and Andrews, we were hearing their name in a very positive way Friday night because I was listening to the match, yep. and we've been hearing some good things, but th 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 uh, the script must have gotten flipped somehow. Is that what you're saying? So it was. It really comes from the fact that Ohio State was a very high velocity team. Mm -hmm. They could deliver a ball with a very high impact. Because of that, the blockers were just not effective. They would go up to go get a block. It would bounce off, but it would hit so hard it would fall out of bounds mm. and be a point for the Buckeyes. On top of that, you're right. Alexis Mattel was named to the All Tournament team for the UIC DePaul right. tournament last week. Mm -hmm. She was great in that, and Jessica Andrews was named Defensive Player of the Week, and that's the crazy thing is they just weren't that effective against this team. The The velocity was too high, and the crazy part about it is in that first matchup on Friday at the Stroh Center, they started off really hot. They managed to get some good blocks. They managed to work well with their blockers, didn't get the win, and then at Ohio State, it feels like the Buckeyes just got their number at that point. 
Yeah, so Chaz, this is now this is real insider volleyball stuff because you know to the untrained eye, when you watch these teams, they all hit the ball hard, right? I mean, they all you know they have incredible verticals, they they crush the ball, but there is a difference between kind of those really upper echelon teams. When you're saying velocity, and you're talking about the speed at which that ball comes off the hands of the attacker, right? And, exactly. And and there's a there is a difference. So you were seeing Ohio State puts a mustard on the ball, and maybe Sunday, maybe even a little more than they did Friday. Is, is that fair? A 100%, you could say that. On, and for Ohio State, they, they had a player who was bottled up for a majority of the game on Friday and then just absolutely bursted out on that mm-hmm. Sunday. And uh, I'm blanking on the name right now. Got the number in my head from Lon Dot. L- what was it, Tyler? Yeah. Londot. Dot. Lon Dot. Lon Dot. Lon Dot. Yeah. Yes, correct. Which is somebody Lon that Dot you know your your partner Ben Korak war- warned us about Lon Dot and said. I mean, I remember when we were in the studio, uh, we were talking about that. And he was just going over the numbers like this. You know, and the preview he wrote at bgfalconmedia.com was all about how Lon Dot is just like a yep. force to be reckoned with. And so, did you see a different player Sunday than showed up on Friday with her? So the thing about Wanda was she on Friday had 13 kills and I believe uh I believe she led. I don't have the stats in front of me right now, but she she was close to leading in kills and that was considered a bad game. The Falcons <laughs> did bottle her up. They had to pull her because the Falcons like I mentioned with the middle blockers with that big tall strong middle had her shut down. On Sunday she could do whatever she wanted. I believe wow. she had a double double before the second set was oh, halfway geez. through. That's crazy. That's and unbelievable. She's one of the best players in the country. Uh, well, um, first, Chaz, like the first thing I want to touch on is th- the crowd Friday night. Like, let's go back to yep. that. And um, you know, when I saw the signs for three thousand, I'm not going to lie. I, I was like, "There's no way they're getting three thousand people. There's not a chance it's going to happen." And man, was I wrong! And I've never been happier to be wrong. Four thousand people, you know, wall to wall. And I listened to the you know the match here on WBGU, and it sounded like the crowd was just into it from start to finish. Well, Carl, I wrote that game. I was I actually wrote yeah. about the crowd for a sidebar on uh, yep. BG Falcon Media, and. That was, hands down, one of the best crowds I have ever experienced at a Bowling Green sporting event. Wow. The only thing that might rival it was last year's Toledo BG game that was in the Stroh Center. I'm talking just about games in the Stroh Center. Yeah. That one and the WNIT matchup mm-hmm. against Florida. That one was absolutely buzzing. But that crowd, I, I remember I talked to the SID for volleyball, Kyle Edmond, right before the game because I was thinking about topics about writing. And as I had walked into the this, this stadium nearly an hour and a half before the game even started, there was a line of students from the student entrance of the Stroh Center nearly to Kreischer. Wow. That, they had nearly 1,000 students at that game, 4,201 total. And it's just crazy to think that not only was that the biggest crowd the Falcons have played on ever for volleyball, it was the biggest crowd of the season for the Buckeyes, and the biggest crowd that, it, that the entire MAC had had since 2011. That that you know, you think about that for a second. You're talking about uh, you know that's a, more than a decade, and you're talking about a conference in. Um, oh, it sounds like they're on a Chaz. Chaz, Chaz could be in run, Chaz, run, run. Chaz, run, what'd you do? <laughs> um, I found him. The um, you know. But, we're talking about a, a conference that has a team like Western Michigan, who is one of the top teams, you know, it's one of the best teams in the, in the region, if not the country, but we outdrew all of them. I mean, that, that, that's amazing. And the thing is, it was the biggest crowd since 2016, I believe. And all of the biggest crowds came with Ohio. Right. So not only did we top every team in the MAC, we topped, in the same state as yeah. well. Yeah, it's so, a- a- amazing. And Ch- Chaz, you were there. Um, is this one of these things where it was like 50-50 Ohio State, Bowling Green, or was it a, was it a really, was it get an orange wave Friday night? I mean, there was quite literally an orange wave during the game. Beautiful. There, the student section started the wave. It kept going around. <laughs> there was about, I'd say, 400 uh, Ohio State fans 
a lot of them were crowded behind the Ohio State bench. But besides that, it was all orange and brown, and they were absolutely buzzing, getting excited. That's I, I you know that is we've talked that about that a little bit here uh, on occasion. Um, you know, Tomich cre- has created a tremendous um, culture around Bowling Green volleyball, and she's had a lot of success. That being said, the crowds really haven't started across our sports to become this electric uh, until Derek Vandermeer showed up here as our athletic director. And um, a thousand fans, a thousand students, I should say, in the Stroh Center for a volleyball match to me is just mind blowing. I, I I can't. I mean, I can't say enough about the student support for that, and not just showing up, but showing out. Right, Chaz. I mean, they they were they were a part of the the they were a part of the game. Well, let me let me tell you a quick story. So I got to talk to Coach Tomich after the match on Friday, and I asked her how she felt about the crowd. And um, now, this isn't an exact quote, but along the lines, she said that. Uh, when she was hired, I believe 13 years ago, they asked her if it would be okay if they moved uh, the bleachers back because they didn't think that they would get that many fans. Mm-hmm. And she said it took them 13 years, but they are selling out the straw. Nice. And they finally got to that point. And she said, no, I don't want you to push it back because we are going to pack this arena with fans. So I thought that was super powerful from her, super exciting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean that you know that um, that's that's exactly what you want. You want to, and I love that you're you know you have a coach who's not just worried about the X's and O's, but really embraces the idea of the fan experience and embraces the community, and that's all starting to pay off. Um, so we're going to turn the page, though, uh, Chaz. As tough as the off se- the non conference ma- the schedule has been, Mid American Conference play is here. And Tyler, you yep. were looking over the beginning of the. Can you just real quick walk us through the beginning of that schedule for volleyball? And then Chaz will get some feedback from you on that. Yeah, so they go on the road for quite a while to start it. So Friday and Saturday, they're going to go to Muncie, Indiana, two against Ball State, follow it up with a trip to Toledo uh, at Savage Arena. And then we won't see them back home at the Stroh Center until uh, October 4th when they have back-to-back matches against Western Michigan. That Chaz, that sounds like a murderer's row way to start Mid-American Conference play. I mean, those are, you know, Ball State, perennial, you know, powerhouse. Toledo is Toledo, and Western Michigan, we know, we know what Western Michigan can do. Is this team ready? We Is it ready to, to bust out? Because it sounds like, you know, there sounds like there's some questions about um, you know, I don't say chemistry, but like getting the right people at the right place at the right time. W- what's your take on the beginning of Mac play? If you think a team that got blown out to end up non-conference play against a team that they have never beaten in 14 games is going to come out and throw a dud up against Ball State on the road, a team that has denied them multiple national champion or multiple Mac tournament championships, you're going to be mistaken. This team wow. is going to unlock some things not because of what they have yet to figure out but what they have figured out from the non-conference the fact that in the non-conference we've seen players like Sidney Hernandez who has come out defensive specialist and shown some things that she could be the next Lindsay LaPinta uh you have other players that have showed up Avery Anders Anna Shitek who have come out and shown that they can be that next wave And on top of that, that there is depth coming from this program, from the freshmen, from the transfers. I believe that even though Coach Tomich and the team would very much like to have won every single non-conference game. Of course. The games where they get embarrassed and the games where they end up falling, where they would not like to, are going to be the most influential. That shows them what to clean up. And on top of that, the fact that you have Ball State arrival. Toledo, a rival, Western, a rival who just defeated them last year to go to the NCAA tournament. If they win that game, they go because that was the MAC tournament mm-hmm. championship. Those are three big matchups, but I will tell you, there's nobody that will tell you those are big more than the Bowling Green Volleyball. 
All right. So you, so I'm hearing you say you think they're ready, uh, Chaz. Like what, give us something we should be looking for. Like what's something we should be watching, a player or um, – you know something like that that we should keep our eye on over these because they're going to be on the road. So we're we're you know we're going to be counting on you and Ben, of course, to be on the road with them and give us the feedback on the radio. But what should we be listening for in those matches? I'll, I'll give you a quick two. So first off, Ben and I were talking about this Anna Shitek and uh, Eddie Botswachik, very big names. Mm-hmm. They Anna, a freshman, Edita, a just a sophomore. They are big names that you are going to hear about a lot more. They are coming in. Anna came in for Amanda Otten against Ohio State. She shone. She looked amazing. Her stats won't show it. The amount of digs she was able to get out one hand, that stuff is unreal, especially as a setter. The setter position is really hard to find. Mm-hmm. Same with Edita. The, uh, the attacking, you need a secondary weapon behind Lauren Hovey. Edita was showing that she can – make those big power plays mm-hmm. and those are either boom or bust on top of that though that that's more what ben was talking about from my perspective i think you need to see something you need to look forward to and expect is a secondary weapon to come out if right. it is an editor that's great mia tyler another big option lauren hovey is amazing she in my opinion is a shoe-in for mac player of the year wow the problem Hot is take. I, I don't think that's hot at all. Okay, I, I, I love it. I think, I mean, she's been she's been mentioned. I think either this year or next year it's her time. But at the end of the day, you need somebody else who will reliably score. Alexis Mattel, she's a middle blocker, but she's had some very big moments. You need somebody who can get you points when Hovey is being absolutely targeted. They they need to work on their spacing, which is something that you can tell that they've needed to work on for at least watching against Ohio State. Ohio State, like I said, a lot of velocity, spacing's been an issue. But besides that, they just need a reliable big-time scorer. Okay, Tyler, you want to jump in on this? Yeah, I mean, Chaz, that's been the biggest weakness, I think, so far this season, is that you don't have anyone behind Hovey. We're talking about Edita. We're talking about these uh, players that are still young. Who is that person, you think, right now that can step up beginning a MAC play for this team? I mean, I think that's a complicated question. I, I don't think that it's going to be the same person every week. Mm. And I think that's the good thing. Is I've mentioned a lot about the depth. There is a lot of depth on this team. Edita, I think, can lead the charge. I think Mia Tyler can also lead the charge. It's all about what people can do week in and week out. We don't need when – I, when I say secondary option, I mean just somebody who will step up in the game, not one person who will step up for the season. And I think that's – where a lot of the confusion comes from is, yeah, there's not somebody you can always go to. Like a Jaden Walls was always super reliable to be the setter. She could, she you could count on her in that moment. That's not going to be like a one person job. Anna Shitek, uh, Amanda Otten, those are going to switch. We're going to see a lot of the depth come into play, and a lot of a revolving door of a secondary scorer. It's just. Is there going to be a secondary scorer each and every game? So, Chaz, it, sound, it sounds to me then um, Tomich's job might be a little more difficult this year because she's got to see who's got that hot hand for that second weapon, right? Who, who's bringing it for that particular match? And who's going to be the setter? Is it going to be Otten or Shitek, or you know, is there going to be some sort of rotation? So she is. She might have to. It sounds like you're saying she might have to pull a few more strings this year than she's than she has in the last year or so. I mean, they brought in nine new players. Yep. Jordan Newblatt, a transfer. They brought in a lot of freshmen. Sydney Hernandez is getting a lot of work as a freshman. Avery Anders got a lot of work today, which was very exciting to see. Anna got some work as well. It's a lot of an injection of new and a lot of usage of old at the same time. Alexis Mattel, grad student, or a fifth year, I'm sorry. Uh, Lindsay LaPinta, a fifth year. That is a lot of a mixture. It's all about how how is she going to balance it? How is it going to be balanced and how and who is going to step up in those moments? All right. All right. Well, Chaz, we're going to let you go because I know you're, you're on the phone and trying to wrap up after this trip to Columbus. Uh, so we're going to be uh, the, the volleyball team travels to Muncie. What is the Falcon Media Sports Network plan for coverage for that uh, for that match? So Ben and I are going to travel to Muncie together. We will have Great. that call on the Friday and Saturday, I believe. And uh, I don't know exactly about writing. I know I will have a preview out 
for Ball State. That is going to be the first game of action, so we will have that out. On top of that, I, I'm going to officially announce a Sunday setter or a Monday right. setter, whatever it is, will be out. I, that is going to be written today. So that is going to be exciting. And we will have a Mac roundup written by Ben and someone new, Andrew. Right. We will get those all figured out. So a lot of content coming out, especially regarding Ball State. Don't know about those recaps, but we will definitely have that call. All right. Chaz McNeil, thanks so much for uh, jumping on the phone to talk to us here on the Zig Zone. And uh, we'll be looking for your work on, w- on, sorry, on BGFalconMedia.com. And uh, tune in to, again, women's volleyball here on WBGU 88.1 FM. Thanks a lot, Chaz. Thank you. All right, our own Chaz McNeil. There you have it. Hey, Reese. Uh, speaking of, we didn't talk about this. What's the plan for um, What's the plan for the call of Saturday's football game? Yeah. So uh, myself and Carter Leonard going to have the call on uh, Falcon Radio. Um, I'm going to try to do pregame around okay. four thirty. We'll right. see if that actually holds true. But uh, that's that's what I'm thinking for right now. All right. So four thirty Saturday, uh, you're going to catch Reese Patricus and Carter Leonard on the call for the football game. Uh, we've got the you know dynamic duo Ben Korak and Chaz McNeil will be covering volleyball. So we're really really excited about that. So a lot going on. Um, okay. So I'm looking at the clock. We got a couple minutes here before we hit the top of the hour. Okay. Reese, I'm going to go to you first on this. Outside of the football game, give us a take on homecoming weekend. Do you want a hot take or do you just want... Uh, I'm, I, just, I I feel like I hemmed you in last time, so yeah. I'm going to give you all the okay. space you want on this one. So we have been talking a lot about, or at least covering a lot about how volleyball just set that attendance yep. record at the stroke. I think over homecoming, over the next, I'll call it homecoming week, over the next seven days, another attendance record will be broken at an athletic event. Really? I don't know. I'm not going to get into specifics okay. of which one it'll be, but I just I think there will be another attendance record broken this week during homecoming. I'll take I will take that. Expectation is big crowd Saturday. We're not going to put one on for the football game. We're going to be a big crowd. Okay. Homecoming weekend. Who's uh, who's next up? It can't just be Reese. He took him for the team here. I will say um, there's no excuse not to catch something Falcon related this week and we got a lot we got a lot going on. Um, I'm seeing a lot of questions. I'm uh, questioning looks right, over here. All right, I'll Go throw ahead. out a little oh, bit of a hot take. I am prepared to say that the Falcons will not drop a single home contest. Which which team were they? Oh, all, all the Falcons. Wow. Total. Okay. It's not crazy to say that. It's Cle- not crazy to say that. How about the the Falcons? Okay, the Falcons go. Homecoming and O. We're going in homecoming. Co- I think the soccer fans in the room are shaking their heads a little. Maybe not. Maybe not. But Lucas looks totally calm and. Uh, uh, no, no, no. I, no. Homecoming weekend this weekend. Yes. They play Friday. Does that count? Yes. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. From no, today all the no. way through the end of next Sunday. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. That'll be fine. I, I agree with Holden. <laughs> okay. I agree with him. Can I, can I piggyback on that? That was, <laughs> that was very convincing. That was very convincing. They'll be fine. They'll be fine. They're the weakest vote of confidence ever, Reese. Go ahead, do I have to get my own hot take too, or can yeah, I just go yeah, yeah, you, you can do whatever oh. you want. Luke. You know what's funny? Because when you asked this question, I was thinking of homecoming like back in high school. Like hot takes like that, or doing anything like this, particularly <laughs> homecoming. If you, want, if you want, if you want, to do a little throwback, no, 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 it's I'll up do, to you. No, I'll, do to BG, you. I'll do VG. I'll do um, I think there will be more alumni at the Falcon Media Tent as a homecoming more than ever. I agree with that. I, I, agree. I can bet, bet a nickel on We're also very excited to say that Jason Jackson of the Miami Heat, who's been a silent report for 20 years, will be visiting. Speaking of an alumni, a, f- a former Falcon Media Sports Network will be here with us. So looking forward to that. Um, Tyler's got his hand on the microphone. I, I feel it coming. He's firmly grasping it. I'm going <laughs> to... I'm going to piggyback off Reese. Okay. I think uh, they're going to shatter the Ziggyville record The football the f- on Saturday at the football game. I think All the right. Ziggyville uh, record gets shattered. I think uh, after seeing the first home game turn out for that, now you put in homecoming, put in all the festivities around it. Gives a reason for people to come to the you, stadium. Z- yeah. Ziggyville showed up last year. I mean, the the student section was it's, there. It's off to a hot start this year, too. Yeah. We talk about volleyball, over yep. a 1,000 people in this row for that. Uh, I don't remember the exact count for the first football game, but I know it was very it high. It was good. I mean, I mean was that was good. some of the best looking I've seen it. I think uh, I think the Doit gets packed with students okay. on Saturday. Uh, so, look, it looks like we're heading to an exciting uh, homecoming weekend, and uh, I couldn't be more excited about that. So, Reese, was that better than the pizza discussion two weeks ago? Yeah, it's nice because I'm not being plastered as... <laughs> 
<laughs> the worst human being to ever walk the streets of Bowling Green. Dead wrong take that was. Dead wrong. <laughs> Well, we still have time. It's in the past, guys. (laughs) Right. Let the past be the past. Let's look to the future. All right. Listen, this has been a great first hour, but we have a lot more going on. Lucas Kleinmeier and Henry Costco are going to catch us up on soccer, where both teams are getting into conference play and a lot of optimism. Don't look now, but our cross-country team, it might be having a moment of its own. Okay, we're going to kick – and by the way – uh, I'm going to give Reese Reese's one for one today. We're going to we're going to try to get keep this winning streak, and we're going to kick off the second hour of Homecoming Week and preview with another round robin. It's only it's fair we give him a chance to talk about food. We're going to talk about our favorite spot for local eats in BG. Does not have to be pizza. Reese is headed towards the studio door right now, but I'm going to give him a chance. This is your big opportunity, Reese. You can do it. You can do it. All right. Well. <laughs> Well, we're going to whet your appetites for some good eats and more sports right after a short break. First, I want to remind you of all the great coverage you can get, uh, sports coverage from the Falcon Media Sports Network team on bgfalconmedia.com. And a reminder, too, if you missed a live broadcast, for example, if you missed that amazing Friday night volleyball match against Ohio State with the 4,201 people in the stro. You can catch it on our YouTube page. Just search for BG Falcon Media on YouTube and catch up on any of those calls. Our own Tyler Cavlitz make sure those are ready to go. Um, Volleyball broadcast from the day is already up. Wow, there you go. So great chance to catch up. We've got a lot more to cover here in the Zig Zone. We hope you stick with us in the second hour. You're listening to the Zig Zone on WBGU 88.1 FM. If you're already awake between 4 and 6 a.m., you may as well have a good time. Check out Early Bird Oldies, playing all the hit music of a different generation on Northwest Ohio's community radio station, WBGU. Don't forget to listen to The Morning Show, immediately following Early Bird Oldies every weekday, right here on Northwest Ohio's community radio station, WBGU 88.1 FM. On September 13th, BGSU men's soccer's Bennett Painter scored the game-winning goal against Northern Illinois, leading to the team getting nationally ranked. Falcon Media Sports Network's Lucas Kleimeyer had the call on the WBGU PBS YouTube channel. Gonna win that one initially, head up again. Wins the second one, however, back to lane, back to Painter! That one's blocked, gets it back, Painter! Bennett Painter! Paints another masterclass at Cochran Stadium. This has been a Falcon Media Sports Network featured call. Hi, this is Lauren Hovey, and you're listening to BGSU Volleyball, presented by Falcon Media Sports Network on 88.1 FM, WBGU. Now, let's get back you to the You can be an essential part of the morning show's continued success on WBGU-FM. The Bowling Green Chamber of Commerce offers businesses and organizations an opportunity to be an underwriter. Under the umbrella of the chamber, you'll receive your mentions each month, during either news and sports programming or feature segments. It's an affordable opportunity to be part of something unique in Wood County. All right, welcome back to the second hour of the Zig Zone on WBGU 88.1 FM, the only radio show that focuses exclusively on BGSU athletics. We're excited to be at the kickoff of homecoming week, and we're going to give Reese Petrikas, who's on a roll. He has come bounced back from the dangerous hot take on pizza. Reese, what's your go-to for local eats here in BG? You know, it's I won't say it's a go-to because I've only had it once. I just tried it the other day. Lupita. Behind yes. Papa John's, all right, fantastic. If you're looking for Mexican eats, quesabiria tacos, unbelievable. Had chori queso, unbelievable. Uh, elotes, unbelievable. I mean, 
I'm n- there's no sponsorship here. No, I mean, no. I'm just going to gas yeah. him up. It was I've had I've had El Zarape, I've had Guajillos, and Lupita is it blows both of them out of the water. Oh, nearly nearly made Holden jump out of the, yeah, jump out of the building there. Jumping out of my chair. I, best I, Mexican. I, lo- I love how passionate Holden is about food because like <laughs> when when Henry dropped that hot take about campus poly ice, I'm not kidding you. It was like watching a Warner Brothers cartoon because Holden's eyes popped out of his head when he's <laughs> fired up. A, so you're a Lapita fan? Oh, 100 percent, 100 percent. One of my buddies put me on like a year and a half, two years ago, and it's just like it's so well hidden you would never see it if you didn't know to look for it. It's tucked in very well back yeah. there. I, I will say the only downside is. Is that it does cost a pretty penny. I got three things and it cost me about thirty dollars. Yeah. So it's a little expensive, but if you have the money and you've got a hankering for Mexican you, food, we, when we did best of BG voting before, you used to have open ended voting where people have to type in the thing, and someone put that hole in the wall Mexican place by the railroad tracks. I'm like, I knew exactly what they were talking about. Yeah, I, okay, I, Holden's in. All right, Lucas. Um, this is probably my answer, but I also just want to I, I just want to also <laughs> stir the pot up again. Okay. Campus poly eyes. Camp- <laughs> here, right. we here, here we go. Here we go. The game is afoot, Henry. What do you have to say about that? Yeah, you think it's gonna be hotter than my take? Uh, go is, ahead. Is it gonna no, be? go ahead. I want to hear. hear. Well, I meant my campus campus poly eyes take from. Yeah, well, no, no, no. what no. he's he he's uh, insulting your honor, if I can be honest. Insulting. Yeah. I put words in my mouth. Uh, I, I did. I stand by it. <laughs> so Henry, are you, gonna, are you just going to stand there and take that? He's your, or you have a better take than that? What's your go-to? I don't really right? have a hot take. My place is Easy Street. That's that's my place. Okay. I like your, to go. What, what is there something on the menu at Easy Street you jump on? Uh, I mean, I'm a healthy eater when I when I go out. Usually, they have a, they have a pretty good they have a pretty good fish fillet. Okay. I gotta say. All right. Uh, that's that's why I get there. Yeah. Okay, Wyatt or or uh, Tyler? I mean, you can't go wrong with Polly Ice. You, you just can't. If we're going yeah. Shane. If we're gonna allow a chain, uh, and Penn Station, Penn Station's hard to beat for subs. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry, Lucas like, no, left the building. If, 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 Lucas, if, Lucas just if, left. He, he, he can't. He cannot tolerate that as an answer. All right, lock him out. Uh, <laughs> if we are talking about <laughs> BG specific, yes, Polly Eyes. Okay, Polly Eyes is my answer. Next, you're gonna say you enjoy Mr. Hero, aren't you? Oh my! No, gosh. that is way. Too, it's it's way too crazy. Okay, Mr. Hero, L- sucks. Lucas, please explain. We're not, we're not doing chains. Like, like, <laughs> no, like, no, I, so I, I, I chains said are cheating. if we like, because it's the best. Wait, that wasn't here. the question, was it? I answered Polly Eyes. Good. Okay. We're fine. Mine Why? is very clearly, uh, if you've had the food truck that's right near uh, Lupita, I think it is, uh, the yellow one, Quality yeah. Food and Grill, is phenomenal. Yeah. Uh, the guy who run it runs it is from Iraq. My roommate is as well. And he's like, the food is just like you get it from there. It's phenomenal. No kidding. I, now, nobody mentioned trigger meals. I, I was going to say the same thing. I was going to say, man. Yeah. I... Th- number one, d- he the dude's amazing, but man, that food is just off the charts. I've, the, I've never tried it, but oh. the pictures he posts on Twitter X, man, I'm I gonna mean, tell you, it's, I'm in the same boat. It looks amazing. It does look good. It Dude, looks amazing. The, the jerk chicken tacos. I'm gonna. T- it's it's like God has come down and kissed me on the lips when I get those things. They are <laughs> so so good. So yeah, I would. And that you know that's amazing thing is. He, you know, he's not advertising all over. If you're not on Instagram or Twitter, it's like you have no idea. But man, it is to me like that is the hidden gem of the Bowling Green culinary world. Like Lupita's is tucked away, but if you don't know that uh, he's Deontay's doing his work, man, it's it's phenomenal. Show of hands, who has had trigger meals? Am I the only one here who's done it? Okay, hold hold. What's your take on? You're a food expert. You're a gastrointestinal. I don't know if I go that far, but I had it one time, and I had some of like a friend's order of like the like buffalo chicken oh, on yes. your fries. And, oh man, so good. I, I vote for Holden to write the food guide for next year yeah, for right. Bowling Green. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. He's got it going on. All right. Now that wasn't too painful, Reese, was it? You survived. No, I, I think I, I think I redeemed myself. You there. did. And you did. I would also like to point out. Ooh, I'll move away from the mic a little bit, but also like to say that I think next time that there's a meeting of any sort, I think Trigger Meal should be catered if we can do that. All right, that's let's, a let's hot help take. out. Let's help out, okay. help out a local business. Let, let's see how BG one day goes, and we'll see if we can. We yeah, can, there we go. We can manage that. All right, that was awesome. Um, so let's uh, let's shift back to sports here. Um, we have. Two hockey, uh, two hockey. I'm thinking. Uh, see, I'm where my mind's at. Two soccer experts here. Lucas Kleinmeier and Henry Costco are going to catch us up. But um, 
I'm going to turn to Wyatt. And Wyatt, why don't you catch us up? We have we have two different sets to deal with here, men and women. What's What happened with soccer? So men's has a had a really physical game there. Uh, Trace Terry scoring both goals, uh, including the game winner with less than four minutes left. Um, but there were two there are injuries on the field there. Um, Drew Bear, the goalie from Bradley, went out. Uh, Kyle Kusamano um, drew a red card for Bradley, but he returned with a bandaged head. Um, just physical game there, but ended out with the win. All right, so let's uh, let's jump into men, and then we'll come back. Yeah, uh, we'll come back to. What's that? No. Oh, oh, I thought you were. I thought Lucas was saying no, that. No, no. All right, so we're, we're gonna we're gonna talk men, then we'll come back to why it'll catch us up on the women. So, um, Lucas, uh, first of all, that you know they they win they beat Bradley, right? Um, can, you know what's uh, what's your take on that? Man, um, yeah, I mean that both teams kind of had similar similar games this past weekend in terms of the physicality of the conference games. That Bradley game was very very up and down very mm-hmm. interesting they were clearly a better team in possession and midfield um but like they've shown this year they have kind of a tendency to give let leave the door open for the opponents to give one or two chances and mm-hmm. maybe they get a goal off of it and then all of a sudden the momentum swings so for the game um it was a weird first goal uh trace terry took a shot and it went over the line but the Bradley center back i'm blanking on his name but he cleared the ball um, the linesman didn't raise his flag, so they thought the ball, the, the game was still in play. So Bennett Painter then redirected it in, so they kind of like messed up who. Yeah, because initially Painter yeah. got the credit for the yeah. goal, right? And then he went back to Terry. Yeah, so it, it showed in the replay that it went over the line on mm-hmm. Terry's shot, mm-hmm. so they gave it to BG. Um, so much deserved. They were mu- the much better team in the first half. Took the lead, had the momentum going into halftime. Um, and then, like I said, they have a tendency to kind of give away one or two right. weird opportunities. They kind of fall asleep. Is yeah, that, yeah, yeah, kind of fall asleep because the way they play, they're so open, especially at the back. So if a team gets them on a counter or they give a ball away in the half, they can get on a break. And that's what Bradley did. And um, the sophomore uh, center back, uh, Gus Peacock, kind of committed a just a sloppy foul, an unnecessary foul. He was late on a challenge, and it was a rightfully called a uh, penalty kick. And uh, Bradley stepped up and converted it, so the game was tied at one one. And you know, from there, you know, it can go and, either and way. Can happen. And it can go either and this way. was a, but this was a late goal by Terry. You know, why just was a late goal. It's not like they got the lead and hung on. It was a, it was late. Can you yeah. talk about like what that means? Yeah, and it was similar to NKU earlier in the week, the one one draw they had in uh, against the Norse because I went to that game mm-hmm. um, and covered it for the website for BG Falcon Media, and um, it was kind of similar in terms of they were the much better team. They were up one nothing. They gave away a sloppy chance, and they got the, a goal off of it, so it was 1-1. But this time, they were able to break through at the very end and get that second goal because, you know, Bradley had the momentum probably, I would say, for 10, 15 minutes mm-hmm. after the goal. It was probably even back and forth. They had probably made, made a couple good chances, but Brendan Graves didn't have a whole lot to do back there. And then when BJ retook possession, retook momentum of the game, um, they were creating chances just – couldn't get anything past the goalie. Yeah. I, I, I think it was Grau was his name that came in for Drew Berry. Mm-hmm. And Grau actually got hurt, I remember, somewhere in the second half, too. They almost went through three goalkeepers <laughs> in a soccer game, which is unheard of for even your one to get hurt. So, let, you know, Henry Costco had the hot take uh, that the men's soccer team would be ranked in the top 25 and happened. The, the voters must have been tuned into the zig zone because that happened. And then they went out and had a draw against Northern Kentucky. So, draw against Northern Kentucky, a team they should have beaten, by your account, I would say, and a win against Bradley. Um, did they stay in the top 25? I think so. I think so. I, I can see them dropping the 25, but I think they're going to stay in because okay. they won last night. And now they're 2-0 and in Missouri Valley Conference play. Right now they're in first place off of six points because you win, you get three points right, inside. Right. So, they have six points. And, you know, performances like that last night and what – some of their other wins, like the NIU win they had a week back and the Michigan State win earlier this year, those are wins where m- maybe they were the better team for majority of the mm-hmm. game or maybe it was even, but they found a way to win right. at the very end. And Sometimes you got to create your own luck and get a, a, a ball to bounce your way, but at the end of the day, they won the game. And that's what Coach Nichols said after the NIU game was he said, you know, that's what championship teams do right. is they manage to win games that they don't play well in. And honestly, they probably haven't played up to their standard that like, like they have the start of the year. I think yesterday was probably their best performance since Butler a couple of games ago because NIU they were they didn't play great, but they managed to steal out the very end with mm-hmm. Bennett Painter. And then NKU they ha- played good the first half and then were terrible the second half, hence why they drawn. Right. So 
So uh, let's talk about the schedule because we talked about volleyball, who just had a brutal non-conference schedule. Their their conference schedule starts off very difficult, but this men's soccer team, their biggest challenges are going to be near the end of the season when they they face the two-headed monster of the Missouri Valley Conference, Missouri State, and Western Michigan. Let's let's get right to it. Can Bowling Green beat those teams? I think you asked me this the first zig zone of the mm-hmm. year, and I, I, you, I you, pre- you might hear this question again. Yeah, because <laughs> and I, I said <laughs> I said no because I have to see it yeah. in order to believe it in a, in a way. I wouldn't put it past them, and honestly, I I know I think they can beat Missouri State. I really do with how they've played this year. Western Michigan man is they they're they're a different breed, and I, I mean. We'll have to see how they do against Missouri State for me to give that mm-hmm. firm answer. But I really wouldn't put it past them this year because there just seems to be something different, just some some sort of magic around the team this year than years prior. Okay, it's kind of like what Reese said about yeah, football. You're, yeah, seeing, you're seeing a little bit of a different some, vibe, right? There's just some vibe with mm-hmm. the team. And now that I've seen them win games where they didn't play their best, and last year they didn't do that, and the year before that they didn't even do that, which means eh, luck might be on their side a little bit. Yeah. So I wouldn't put it past them because – Upcoming, I mean, they have Eastern Illinois Tuesday. That, I that's mean, a non-conference game. Yeah, non-conference okay. game. That's, I mean, that's if that's not a win, then you might not see me for a couple weeks. And they might not um, be in the top twenty-five, right? Right. They, oh, they drop that. No, that be, they won't be in the top fifty if they oh. lose to them. Wow. Um, <laughs> uh, Bel- Lucas is throwing haymakers over. Oh here. yeah. <laughs> uh, Belmont Friday uh, this coming week. That's a Missouri Valley Conference game. Belmont tied Western Michigan in their yes, first MVC yeah. game, mm-hmm. and I watched that game, and I was surprised of how good Belmont looked, but also really? how bad West, Western Michigan Western looked. Western played down. Western yes. played down a level. Yes, exactly. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of similar to the MAC this year in terms yeah. of like, yeah, anything can really happen. Depends on momentum and depends on uh, injuries and health and team and yeah. all that stuff. So Belmont's a big game this coming Friday. I'll have the call on that on WBGU PBS's YouTube channel. So. Looking forward to that one. Um, so I'm sorry, you, you have Eastern Illinois, or you're going you're to be uh, well, no BCSN's got that one. Okay. But we do have a radio call of that one on Falcon Radio. That's Henry Costco and nice. uh, Foster, and I can't pronounce his last name, so I won't butcher it. Foster Rostai. 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 What a last name. Awesome. So we okay. will have that. Yes. Okay, that's that's all good news. Uh, here's a question for you: Can they get to ten wins? Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. What I would, would that I would mean to the program, Lucas? What does that number mean to the, oh, to, to get to ten? It's wins? huge. Well, well, first, being I, I, being ranked twenty fourth in the country is such a. I mean, that is a huge, mm-hmm. huge honor, especially for a school like Bowling Green. That's a mid, a mid major level school mm-hmm. that doesn't get a whole lot of credit in the athletics world and a lot of other sports. So, I mean, I give credit to Coach Nichols for doing that in his sixteenth year, and this isn't the first time he's been ranked nationally. The last yeah. time was twenty twenty two. They're ranked twenty five coming in the year so that's really hard to do um and to be to get 10 wins for a program i mean that that's just that's just monstrous in terms of just recruiting and in terms of just their overall i guess level and how they're viewed Mm -hmm. amongst the rest of the country to the conference because they're seen as kind of a b-tier program where they're really good they like to punch above their way they can beat an elite team every now and then but they're not consistently up there and that's what nickel strives to be as he's trying to make this program an elite program consistently year in and year out um, I think it also would mean in terms of like the the players that come from Ohio because if you look at the roster, most of these players are from Ohio. They're either of from course. the Cincinnati area, they're from the Cleveland area, they're from the Columbus area, or they're from here. We have a couple players that are from Perrysburg or mm-hmm. Toledo local area. Um, Nichols is one of the few. Nichols and the Falcons are one of the few teams in Ohio that recruit players around the high school and Ohio and academies consistently. Mm-hmm. Now Ohio State does it. Um, Wright State does it. Uh, Akron does it a little bit, but no other really program does it at all. I know schools like Dayton and Xavier don't have any Ohio kids at, wow. if at all, really. So I think that would be a big in terms of the local Ohio high school yeah. player when they're picking the school to go to. It's, well, our program, we recruit players like you who play at schools right. like you, and also we do good by winning 10 games a season and contending for our That's conference what, you know, Former football coach Dave Clawson used to say, we have to recruit the state of Bowling Green. Yeah, and that I think that there's something, um, you know, for a school that's not going to have the budget to be, you know, flying out to California to recruit or whatever, like to be able to recruit and recruit the best, some of the best players in the state, and give them a place to land where they can really compete is is something. All right, okay, so non-conference Tuesday, 
uh, Friday, Belmont. Yep. And where is that game happening? Is that a home game? Yes, it is. Okay, back-to-back there's back a, home games. Yep. There's an exciting. Oh, talk. Uh, we're going to talk about the, the women's the women's crowd, which you said was a good one, which mm-hmm. Henry's going to touch on a little bit. I think here in a second. Um, what kind of crowd do you think we can expect for homecoming? It's Friday night, first like the first night of the homecoming weekend. What do we expect? Big, big, big for sure. The you know season opener right state was a massive crowd as it always is because mm-hmm. it's August and school's not in session yet and yeah, yeah. parents can come down. NIU was packed. It was packed. I mean, that place was rocking. Um, Student section was great. It was great. It was, it was great. Uh, Butler was was pretty good for a Saturday where there were a lot. That was the first like college football weekend. Yeah. There was a lot of other events going mm-hmm. on. So that I mean, that crowd was was pretty good. And then I mean, I don't I don't expect anything different. Belmont's a Friday night game. Students are all going to be here because homecoming's the next day. Yeah, parents can come by because it's the end of the the work week. Right. It's a it's a MVC game. It's a big game, and I think it's going to be packed. All right, we're looking for a packed uh, packed house at Cochran. Why? Uh, before we let uh, turn it over to Henry, catch us up on what's happening with the women's team and uh, some success. So we went to a battle I-75 today. Um, it was 1-2-1, to one, but it did snap their three-game shutout streak. Would have been really nice to get that, especially mm-hmm. against Toledo. Yes. Um, but still a really good thing to see uh, coming through 2-1 to one there. All right, Henry, let's let's talk women's soccer. Um, we scored two goals, which I'm I'm – even as a non-soccer fan, I'm amazed at because that has been a challenge for this team. So is this the beginning of the Bowling Green women's soccer team consistently – putting on some offensive pressure well it could be um it's two games it's too early to really put mr you know, mr put, hot put take name henry costco is I'm, backing off i'm just gonna put i, that I out will there. say my my hot take about the goals last week came true as well what did i say was it they'll score at least three goals in the two games i okay. think it was all right and it came true so yeah big 2-1 win today against toledo and a, a second goal that actually ended up being an own goal for toledo um but it, it got the job done it was um result of the cross into the box but yeah, a two one win against Toledo, and then a big two zero win at Muncie uh, against Ball State and last that, week, which that, was that, an extremely impressive. That kicked off conference play. Right? I mean, that's a great yeah. way to start conference play to you know thump somebody two zero on the road. What right? I mean, yeah. that's that. There's something special about that. Yeah, it was it was a really special performance. They really came out, and the second half was really what impressed me. That's where they got both their goals, and Amelia Ankerfer had a great header in her in her first goal. But I, I just want to shout out Falcon Media Sports Network member. Elena Unkefer, right. right? So right. let's give a little shout out to Elena Represent. there. Yeah, right. representing for sure. Um, all right, so uh, w- how is this happening, though, Henry? Like, where are the contributions coming from that we're seeing this team really start to gain some momentum? One thing that I've seen, Toledo, this Toledo game was completely different from the Ball State game. That's what Coach Fox said. The Ball State game was, they got a lot of their success from being really open. They played really end to end offense, was what got them, especially their second goal. That's what. Was a result of it was a result of an end to end play um, between the Hoekstad, the Stransky uh, across the field basically, mm-hmm. but um, that's that's where they they saw success and that's where they haven't really done much offensively, especially um, in the game against Oakland where they drew uh, last Thursday. They didn't have a lot of end to end offense. It was just a lot of relying on possession to just get the ball gradually up the field and get you know a multitude of chances. And credit to Coach Fox, he saw that they had problems you know creating goals with that and he changed it up and. How, how did out. he change it up, Henry? How did things change for, well, the, for the uninitiated? Because you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me, the non-soccer fan. So, what is it? What did he change change up? So he opened. So he opened up the play. The, opened up the field to play a lot more. When when he runs his initial possession system, he runs it gradually through short passes. Um, it's like it's called like tiki taka is what is mm-hmm. what I like to call it. It's short passes um, between defense to midfield to strikers. You know, five passes, five six passes before you get the ball forward to a striker for a chance um when you open when you open play up a bit more you can get uh chances from the defense all the way to the striker position you can get um chances based off of like transition from maybe a free kick um on the other team and then they go quickly and they get a ball to the other side where Bryn Gardner is waiting um they did that a couple a couple times on the Toledo game but that's generally where they got a couple of their most successful chances in at Ball State and they had some success with it at Toledo as well all right, so we you know we were talking since since the beginning of the year. We've been talking about the transition to the Chris Fox style of play, and I'm gonna look at Lucas for confirmation because I can't see Henry through the screen. As we've said, uh, Chris Fox, it's all about possession, and this is a very different 
system than a lot of soccer teams, but different than from what we saw from Jimmy Walker. So does this mean, Lucas, we're seeing the team starting to kind of maybe get it, get get it, air quotes, get it a little more, and we're going to we should maybe expect some more consistency? Yeah, I would say so, especially after these two results, because. I mean, now I, I believe we're halfway through the season. I mean, eight games. I, I believe they play 17, 17 or 16. I mean, either way, 17. 17. Sure. Um, th- you know, these results, I mean, today, because I, I did video for today. I'll have mm-hmm. highlights out later for uh, the website um, and our YouTube channel. Um, they just seem to get it more, kind of like Henry was saying. It kind of mm-hmm. seems like, you know, they open up play a little bit more. They're and that, that's that, that's Fox adapting to his yeah. players a little bit though too, yes. right? Yeah, because I think that's what needed to happen mm-hmm. because he might want to play a certain way, but sometimes you might not have yeah you the know, might not have the horses yep. you might not have the horses to do that. But um, today, you know, it was just very gritty. It was a very physical conference game against your arch rivals, your school rival. You know, thirty minutes up north. Mm-hmm. Um, but they still look good, you know. For for me, I, I think, I, and I think, like you, I, like you said, I think that's just them, them getting it now. I think they're just kind of constantly get more comfortable as the season goes goes along, and I think more so the moments when it wasn't going well today, when because Toledo actually was a lot more better than I thought, um, when they lost possession playing out of the back, or Toledo had a couple breakaways, they didn't seem rattled really. Mm-hmm. Um, the only time they you know they seem rattled when they gave they gave the early goal today. And, you know that kind of put them behind the eight ball to start the game. But as they grew into the game and got back into it, they seemed fine. But the little moments during the game where you know they lost possession or you know just didn't quite execute the, the same game plan as as they wanted, they seemed okay. Like they seemed fine. They seemed like you know short memory. You know mm-hmm. the next one, which is what you uh, want, right? Where he's like, don't short memory next next play. Yeah, right? and, and like today, like like I said with men's soccer is. Maybe you don't play your best, but at you the end of the day, like, do you win the game? Right. Like, do you find to win the right. game, and especially in conference play? And they did. And, and, th- and you got to win the conference play. So, okay, so Henry, what's what's next? Look, take us ahead to what you know. It's homecoming week. What's what is on the docket for women's soccer for homecoming week? Yeah, two home games for men. There's one home game uh, for the women. They'll play Thursday night. That'll be. Against OU, they'll be right here at Cochrane Stadium at 7 p.m. on Thursday. Okay, so it's uh, just a reminder to all the students out there, the bars will be open after the soccer game, so you can go to the soccer game and still get yeah. to the bars. I, I think it's worth noting, too, because Henry and I were talking about the field condition at uh, Cochrane. Yeah. Really? What's, it's what's very... Up? It seems very wet and muddy I'm already, kidding. and usually and, that doesn't happen until the end. And, of the and year. it's going to rain more the next yeah. couple of days. It's gonna rain Which is more. weird because it hasn't. When was the last time it rained here? I mean, it hasn't rained in a yeah. long time, at least yeah. like about fifteen minutes from now. Yeah, right now. Yeah, I'm just gonna. It's, okay. I'm just looking out the way. Uh, okay, any minute now. Okay. But I, yes, before the game. Yeah, no, nature's no, answering your call. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but now they played today. Yep. Like we mentioned, home game Tuesday. Home game Thursday, home game Friday. That's four games in a week. Yeah. And what kind of condition is Cochran going to be in yeah. by the time this weekend? Because the field last year was in really good shape until women's played Central Michigan for their, I believe, second to last home mm-hmm. game of the season, and it downpoured the entire oh, game. And the field was, I mean, it was done by then. So what is that? So with our two teams, what's the impact on their play when the field gets to, I mean, it's getting soft and mushy? What's the, what's the impact? I like to hear Henry's take on this, but for, but for me, I mean, that's huge. That you, that you hear players talk about all the time. I mean, it's it can, it's a big difference between grass and turf, and in bad grass is not good. It can it can change how a team will go into a whole game is based on how how the ball will react to the grass. It it affects it affects men's a lot more because of how much faster paced it can be. And I mean, we'll we'll have to see the cleat marks on the field today when I was yeah. walking when I was doing video before yeah. pregame was kind of like okay, is this November? Because the wow. field seemed like November condition where it's like towards the end of the year. It was just very. I don't know if they overwatered it with the sprinkler systems. It, it, it was patchy. It yeah, was. It's like they're missing. Patchy. They're missing grass. Very patchy, wow. and, it's, and it's pretty noticeable with the probably view that Henry had today on top mm-hmm. of the of the booth, where you can see the whole stadium. It's very patchy around the near the touch lines, and then you can tell they planted a little bit of grass inside the box near the mouth of the goal. Yeah, yeah. But they've watered it so much 
that it looks mushy. Oh it boy. looks looks wet. So I hope it holds up towards the end of the year. Well, we'll have to, it's something to keep our eye on. So okay, so Friday night's match. What's the coverage plan, Henry? Give us a, catch us up on what we can expect. You mean Thursday night. Thursday night. There again. Uh, that'll be on BCSN, so we are not going to have a call. I don't, Lucas, we don't have a call for Yeah, that, we right? don't. We, we don't have time. We don't okay. have the spots in race. That's all right, because we'll have, but we will have full coverage on bgfalconmedia.com yes. for mm-hmm. that Thursday night uh, match. Do they have a game this weekend, Henry? Uh, they play at Oxford against Miami. That's Sunday at 1 p.m. And okay. then they'll be off until uh, next Saturday, which is home against the NYU. Wow. So that, that's a long stretch. They, they, could yeah. go, they could possibly go 4-0. I mean, this this is a revenge game at OU because OU beat them in the MAC tournament last year. And okay. Miami just got trounced 6 nothing by Western Michigan wow. in the women's soccer. So they could <laughs> go 4-0. Well, anytime we can beat Miami is a good, is a good day because um, they're – I like them just about as much as Toledo. Okay. All right. So uh, dial into bgfalconmedia.com for that soccer coverage. Both soccer teams showing a lot of life. Um, we're going to take a short break, and we're going to come back with our uh, last sports segment. We're going to dig into uh, another non-revenue team that might be flying on the radar, but strikes me, and I am on record, as saying this is going to be their breakthrough year. Um, they're making a name for themselves. Before we take that break, I'm just going to remind you that this Wednesday you can pick up the BG News across campus and around town. Uh, we've got 12 editions every semester, uh, fresh weekly happenings, BG News, and all your other news on bgfalconmedia.com. You're listening to The Zig Zone on WBGU 88.1 FM. <laughs> You could listen to WBGU 88.1 FM, or you could be part of the action. Volunteer with WBGU FM in a variety of roles, including on-air, promotions, social media, music selection, and more. For more information, visit the WBGU Facebook page. Volunteer with Northwest Ohio's community radio station, WBGU 88.1 FM, the return to radio freedom. My name's Emma Stransky. I'm a winger for BGSU Women's Soccer. Um, my four favorite animals are yeah. ferret, because I have two and they're the cutest things ever. Falcon, because we're BG. Fox, because Chris Fox, our coach. <laughs> and then a flamingo, because I think that they're pretty. On Monday, September 16th, Bowling Green Golf participated at the Golden Grizzlies Intercollegiate Tournament, placing fourth out of the 15-team field. The Falcons had quite a showing, shooting 22 over par as a group. Senior Xander Gibson shined, shooting seven under par in his third round, making it to the best round of the tournament, allowing the Falcons to jump three spots in the tournament standings. Senior Darren Hudak also had a notable performance, tying his career low in the first round by shooting four under par. Lastly, senior Luke Evans was able to record an eagle on the second hole of the tournament to give Bowling Green a head start. This has been 60 Seconds in Falcon Athletics. The Falcon Marching Band showing us a little respect as we come into the home stretch here on the Zig Zone on WBGU 88.1 FM. Still got a lot to talk about. Uh, our cross country expert Holden Rock is going to take us through that. Wyatt, before we do that, why don't you catch us up on what happened with cross country this weekend? So, men's and women's cross country uh, were competing at Western Michigan's George Dale's Invitational. Um, men's with no team score, but did have three runners, three runners with the personal best with Bentley, Willard, and Weber. Um, women's had a big show out, um, won the George Dale's uh, Invitational. Um, first win in a 6K race, not at Bowling Green in over 10 years, about 10 years, decade. Um, really great team effort there, uh, led by Cummison with the sixth place finish and. Um, and a personal record as well. Sorry, fourth place finish, and with a personal record as well, followed by Rose and fifth with a personal record as well. All right, nice, uh, nice effort by the w- women's team. A- and Holden, turning to you a- after the mysterious Ball State non-meet, catch us up on 
on what happened. Before we talk about the Western Michigan win, which we do want to talk about, talk to us about Ball State. Yeah, so not yesterday, but the week before they were supposed to run at Ball State was hosting a MAC championship preview meet, essentially. Um, the first time that Ball State has actually hosted a meet right. in quite some time, as far as I could find anything mm-hmm. recorded on our um, documented history. Um, but the team pulled out, and it was a little bit mysterious as to why, and Central Michigan also didn't run despite being registered. And I had the chance to sit down with Coach Snelling uh, last Thursday and talk about some things. As far as Central Michigan, they didn't end up traveling at all, so they didn't wow. make the trip. Um, but as far as we go... Because we were there. Our yeah, team we, was we there. were, in fact, there. They got there. They were kind of going through warm-ups, walk-through type stuff, and Coach made the decision not to have the team run. And he explained it to me. Um, we had heard some kind of rumblings that it was maybe a course conditions issue, and he elaborated on that. Okay. So basically the crux of it Wait is, a minute. I'm going to let everyone know. BG Falcon Media, Falcon Mike Speeders Network, Network exclusive by Holden Rock. Bring it. So um, in Muncie, for Ball State's campus, the location that they run the 6K and 8K races that they've kind of just come up with Mm -hmm. is around a perimeter of pretty, like, common campus ground. Whereas you go to the Mel Broke course here, and it's, you know, a former golf course, former kind of nature area. It's its own separate partition that's not, like, frequented by other activities. At At least not legal ones. (laughs) At Ball State, that's not how it is. Okay. It's all surrounded by adjacent roads Mm. and contained into, you know, common walking area and as a result of that the terrain is not at all like up to par for yeah. kind of appropriate footing um if you follow the outside of the perimeter within which they run it's not even a full mile around and they're racing up to 8k wow. and so it's a lot of redundant looping which you know already will lead to it getting more torn up once you've yeah. gone over it three four times in one race and then do the next one yeah let alone coming back in a couple of months or you know a month or so for the mac championships I guess Coach Snelling's viewpoint was that because the terrain is, you know, already kind of worn down and walked on, it's not, like, nicely conditioned. Like, yeah. a, a nicer course that's been cultivated for a while and used for a while gets treated a lot more like, a, you know, like a green at a golf course even. Right. That similar standard. And there were a lot of spots where the footing was apparently precarious enough that Coach felt as though it wasn't worth it to the team because they could be putting themselves at risk and yeah. has also – going on record saying that he thinks that if they can't up the quality of it that like he's fairly vocal that he thinks that they should try to move the championship somewhere wow. else if possible but there's also only so much sway or power that a coach can have that, tyler so. i want you to capture that sound that's a keeper right there that's a that's a hot take all right that listen that's big holden i mean because the question that was rolling through my head as you were talking is yeah that's great but we've got a championship to run there but what snelling is saying is maybe not and I think the the push comes to shove. Coach said, you know, he's only one coach in the MAC. Doesn't right. really have right. any sway over that. And in all likelihood, they're probably going to end up running it there because the bids usually just get set somewhat in advance right. and they just kind of roll right. with it. And so the teams are going about their processes, you know, the same as they're going to every yeah. other week to just, you know, bring their A game each time, which... I think is reflected in what's then happened yeah. this past weekend. So to, uh, two two things. And one is if I'm Coach Snelling, I'm offering up our course. Okay, come Bowling Green, our course is ready for the MAC championship. We're more than happy to host that. Do you think that's a possibility? Uh, I think that would certainly be on his radar to do. However, I think given the circumstances of the fact that the other teams participated, and as far as I can tell. Like no issues. It doesn't seem okay. to have been issues, and that doesn't make it the wrong decision. Right, I mean, right. it's very you know athlete to athlete, case mm-hmm. to case, dependent, and so. So th- then the other thing is, this is where if something does happen to a runner at this championship, that's that's something where th- there's going to be a, there's going to be an issue. Like if someone from Bowling Green runs in that championship in a couple weeks and ends up twisting an ankle or something like that. That's not going to reflect well in Ball State at all. No, if something like that happens, there certainly will be a reckoning, but I suppose it'll have to remain to be seen once the teams go back to Muncie. All right, well, so lots of intrigue there, but let's talk about Western Michigan, Um, this this invitational that uh, kind of laid out to the schedule. Man, we have three men with personal bests. We had, uh, you know, the women come in with the first win in a long time. 
Talk us through what that all means, Holden. Yeah, so on the men's side, it's a little bit simpler. There were only four participants mm-hmm. total, but I think it is definitely a step in the right direction to see three of them having personal yeah, bests. Yeah, for sure. It's already true in high school running, and especially at the college level. Like, that's not something that's easily come yeah. by. You know, running the best that you ever have in your life is right. very, very non trivial. And so for the three of them to do that was really big. Um, Obviously, as far as the season and team standing goes, you know, they only had four runners, so they didn't score in the team standings. But Coach Snowing seemed to speak with some confidence that some of the runners, such as Anthony Sweet, who haven't, you know, run in the meets thus far, are making good progress towards being in the place they would like to be. And what about on the women's side? Cubison, man, knocked it out of the park. And, uh, you know, we've had a couple people, you know, really placing really, really well. Um and it sounds like, you know, again, you've talked about the youth on this team potentially, you know, kind of helping, maybe helping it elevate. Um, is it, are, are we about to have a moment with cross country? Is the women's team going to have a moment? On the women's side, I think you came out of the weekend seeing everything you could possibly want to see and more. The puzzle pieces are really falling into place. I mean, anybody who's not super well versed in cross country, they maybe know Kaylee Perry's name, right, more right. likely than not. She didn't even run this weekend, wow. and they still won the race. That's amazing. With competition of Western Michigan, Eastern Michigan, mm-hmm. Central Michigan, all the directional Michigans. <laughs> the and, whole compass was covered. We and that's that. non-trivial. That's three of your yes. conference teams. You've already beaten Akron earlier in the year, mm-hmm. contended with Toledo. And notably, between the last time they raced and this one, they had uh, several of the freshmen who didn't race attached race attached. And that doesn't mean they've like completely foregone their Red-shirt. red-shirting status. Um, but... Amelia Barilla made her collegiate debut, placed 40th, which was, you know, a solid showing for her first race. Reese Riemann, another one of the freshmen, was 14th overall in the race. Um, And then really looking at Kylie Cubson and Regina Rose being typically the two and three runners on the team, for them to both have a personal record is, again, just huge for the team. Because, you know, those are two runners that are in arguably the most critical spots you know they're right at the top right, of the list right. and for the best runners to be having their best, best runs meets, right yeah of their careers is very very yeah optimism inspiring and the, again I'll, I'll remind everybody but my first hot take of the year was women's cross country wins it all this year they're going to bring home the mid-american conference title and it sounds like the stars might be lining up to, to at the very least they have to be in the conversation oh i think they certainly do and i think Talking with Coach Snelling, it seems to reflect that everyone has really been making progress exactly as he's envisioned. And, you know, they went into Saturday's race with the mindset of, hey, we can race with anyone, we can beat anyone. And they did that. And notably, between the first race of this season and the race um, on Friday, the top two finishers for the team last race were Kaylee Perry and freshman Lexi Panning. And neither of them even ran on Friday, yeah. and the team still won in That's incredible pretty convincing job. fashion. And here's the, the quote that Coach Snelling shared after this match, and this is a direct quote. We raced with a championship focus and mentality today. Beyond the results, I'm really excited with their focus and for where they can take the season. That sounds to me like a coach who's thinking title. He's not the second place, I don't think he's that. I think he's thinking about the whole thing. It absolutely does. And you look at what Wyatt read off earlier, you know, the team won their first 6K not held Here. on a home course in 10 years. That's so important to them, I think, to really feel like, hey, we can go, we can go anywhere and run against anyone to, and hang hold, with them and beat them. Hold, let's let's do a little insider baseball on this. Um, what is it like for these runners, you know, they, they run here all the time, right? They know the broad course like the back of their hands. But to go to these other courses, how difficult is it to kind of know the course? It, you know, w- without a course, you, d- you just don't run very regularly. Yeah, I mean, I think loosely you can build a little bit of familiarity if it's a course you run annually. You know, the Paul Short run is a race they do every right. year. The Tommy Evans they do pretty routinely for other teams coming here for the Mel Brode Invitational right. would be something they do routinely. But by and large, if you're going into a new course, there's definitely a learning curve to it. I mean, there's a wide variety. You know, it's not a football field where it's flat right. and uniform basically anywhere you go. You know, you could have different hills or dips exactly. and turns where you're not exactly. expecting them. And I think it's just one of many pieces of the mental game for a runner is like figuring out knowing your own personal strengths and weaknesses and figuring out like what areas you may need to take advantage of or you know i really need to maximize my pace going up this hill because otherwise i might get gassed on the other side or something like that all right uh you know excited again we were talking before the show pretty much every team that's in action right now has 
is capable of having a moment, right? Both cross-country teams, the men lagging a little bit, but it sounds like things could be coming to place from the women seem clearly on track, both soccer teams rolling. All right, so we're, uh, we're turning the corner. We're going to take a very short break and come up with our final segment, and everybody here is going to give us their one hot take for whatever is on your mind. And I won't point at Reese and ask him about food. It'll be whatever, whatever you want, Reese. That's the way it is. All right, um, before we take that break, I want to tell you about something we're working on here at the Falcon Media Sports Network. In just a few weeks, BG Falcon Media and BG24 will be bringing the swoop to uh, uh, to you all. A video sportscast focused exclusively on BGSU sports. We'll have new uh, new episodes every week with exclusive features and commentary every Wednesday. Um, and we'll, we'll have a lot more details for you in the, the weeks to come, but stay tuned. Should be pretty exciting. Um, we'll be right back with some final BGSU hot takes in just a moment in this short break. You're listening to The Zig Zone on WBGU 88.1 FM. WBGU FM is Northwest Ohio's community radio station. Tune in daily for local programming that includes the morning show, oldies, indie rock, children's music, folk, jazz, world music, and so much more. WBGU is the return to radio freedom. Give us a listen on 88.1 FM or online at bgfalconmedia.com. 88.1 FM, WBGU, Northwest Ohio's community radio station. Welcome back to the Zig Zone, our final segment here on our special homecoming edition. Thank you to the Falcon Marching Band and Shaking a Tail Feather to get us back into the groove here. Um, we're gonna we, we got a lot to wrap up here, but uh, let's do a quick go around. Give us some hot takes. Uh, I'm gonna give Reese a break here. I'm not gonna point at him, Henry. Since I can't see you, I'm gonna let you kick us off here. Uh, I'll stay with soccer here. I think three home games, uh, two men's, one on Tuesday and Friday, and then the women's played home on Thursday. I think all three of those will be wins. I don't, and that's not a super big hot take. I think they'll be favored in all three of those matches. They could oh. easily be. Uh, hey, and I'll, Henry, I'll, I'm going to take your word for it. Okay, uh, Tyler, you're up. Uh, I'm going to go with a season long hot take. Okay, I am. Uh, drinking the Kool-Aid with men's soccer right now. I think men's soccer okay. wins uh, the Missouri Valley Conference. Wow. All right. All right. I'm, I'm loving it. Go, go ahead. Lucas is... I, I am buying into Bennett Painter and Taylor Dyson. Okay. I, I think that Chase duo... Terry. Well, I'm going to add a trio there. I'm going to include Taylor Dyson in that. He's been good. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'll stick with men's soccer since it's the sport I cover. I'm going to say that this is... I don't... I'll actually, I'll have to check with Mike Sheehan. Go ahead. I'll have to check with uh, Mike Sheehan on when the last time this happened, but I think Trace Terry and Bennett Painter will both get double-digit goals this year. They both have six wow. goals. Painter's got five on the year. Trace has six. I think they'll both get ten by the end of the season. Do either one of them get in the conference player of the year conversation? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, there was no doubt oh, yeah. about well, what that are, What are the odds we have a 1-2 voting there? It'll be it'll be Jesus yeah. Brea or it'll be... Be one of the Bowling Green players. Okay, yep. Reese Patricus. All right, I'll stick with my forte, and I kind of mentioned it the last time we're I was. Talking pizza. I just we're, yeah, sure. we're not talking. We're not talking pizza. Um, I, as I said, I'll stick with my forte, and apparently <laughs> that's not pizza. Um, but it's not. I. Anyway, agreed. All right. Anyways, um, I think that. The 2024 John Mackey Award winner, and for those of you who don't know what the John Mackey Award is, it goes to the best tight end in college football. I think the John Mackey Award winner plays in Bowling Green, Ohio, and that's Harold Fannin. He leads all tight ends still in college football in receiving yards. He's top 20 in the nation in receiving yards, and that includes everybody, receivers, running backs, tight ends. The next closest tight end to him, at least for on ESPN standings, is tied for 71st. Holden wow. Willis out of Middle Tennessee State, Jeez. 258 yards compared to Fannin's 349. And here, I'll build off of that. Somebody was saying, well, you know, we might lose into the transfer portal. I'm like, there is not a chance this man is playing college football next year. I, he will be in the league. He's got to be. I, 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 I don't want to personally call out Harold Fannin, but Harold, if you are not, if you don't, if you have a great year this year, and you don't go into the NFL, man, what are you doing? Yeah. Because there is an opportunity where you can make 
millions and millions of dollars. Whereas, yeah, if you go to Georgia, you could probably get a sweet NIL deal, but then you're also risking yeah. getting injured and right. then you lose a bunch of money once you jump to the NFL. You have a great season this year. You can go in the second round. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully, I, I hope Tyler agrees with me. Hopefully it's to our Cleveland Browns because a duo of him and David and Joku would be absolutely filthy. Yeah, it would be. Do, do also. Do we know what the uh, tight end receiving record for Bowling Green is? Do we know how approachable that is That's for fans this question. year? I'll I'll get back to him. There, there, there's yeah. there's some research to do for sure. I mean, I think Fannin has to do a little weight room work and uh, get his blocking up to speed to be an NFL star. But he certainly he's well on his way. And, and the, the intangibles that guy has no. with his frame, his speed, the yep. the shiftiness, uh, lateral movement. Yeah, it's yeah, he's you don't athlete. get that every day. And it's also fancy. I just want I'm. I'm just going to give a shout out to the Federal League back home myself. I'm a Uniontown Lake graduate of the Federal League, Fannin from Canton McKinley. I mean, I love when I get to shout out not only the Federal League, but just a 3-3-0 as a whole because <laughs> I very much love where I come from. And it's so awesome to see a guy who walked the I won't we didn't walk the same halls, but we've walked the same streets, I'm right, sure. Right. It's awesome to see someone from my neck of the woods getting the recognition well, they and deserve. Well, like you know, Lucas pointed out with men's soccer, like to to recruit the the state of Bowling Green and have a low, you know, have some local stars say, "You know what? I don't have to leave Ohio to play at a at a high level and potentially play in the league." And let's also say that this could be the second or third tight end from Bowling Green to be in the league in the span of like 7 years. You know, Quentin yeah. Morris is still there. Um, so there's some real, you know, yeah. there's something going on there. Christian Sims had a cup of coffee That's with your, the Rams. Yep. Uh, he was, I think he was a practice squad member for a year. So, and, yeah, yeah, something going on. All right. Holden, what do you got for us? I'm going to stay in the world of football here because Reese has put us into a good spot of talking about here. Um, and I don't want to be too, like, obvious, like, trying to be controversial and say, oh, going undefeated. <laughs> I genuinely think BG finishes the conference slate with one conference loss. There. Go ahead, Reese. What do you who, think? Who, who are you thinking? Who are you thinking uh, they lose to? I fear it may be the team up I-75. Uh, right. Lucas is and Lucas Klymeyer has <laughs> left the building. <laughs> however, however, after the Tucker Gleason performance of yesterday, I'm not convinced that we can't clean them out, it's, frankly. It, can we celebrate the fact that Toledo could lose to two teams from Bowling Green in the same year? Can yep. we talk about When's that? The that right? When's the last time that happened, baby? When's the last time that happened? Never enough. No, yeah. no. Yeah, well. Yeah. I was, I'm going to pitch this one, too. I know Carl and I, we talked about this. Do we think a MAC team finishes undefeated in a MAC play this year? That's a that's a good question. If anyone does it, it's Bowling Green. Yeah, because I think so you too. Think, yeah, I think before going into this week, I think NIU had the best shot, the but they just lost to Buffalo. Yep. Yeah, so Buffalo. that can't happen anymore. I think Bowling Green has the best opportunity because who are the teams that have really had Bowling Green's number in conference play? And I think Ohio. the number one team that comes to mind is yeah. Ohio. And they're not. On guess the who's not on the conference yeah. schedule this year? Yeah, the Bobbies. So the I think cats. I think. If you can if you can take care of Toledo on the road, I think Toledo on the road is the toughest yes. conference game you have because Miami is at the Doit this year. You've got Akron at the Doit or Akron's on the road. You've got NIU at the Doit, uh Kent State at the Doit and Miami. Is it Jaeger? Is it Miami at Jaeger? No, Miami Miami's, Miami's here this year. On Black Friday, by the way. Thank you at for noon. that. Thank you for that home game, Mid American Conference. And the road contest, candidly, from what we've seen don't, so far, don't look that tough. It's, Akron yeah. at Central Michigan at Ball State. Yeah. Uh, Very I think, manageable. I, I think I mean Ball State is a team that did give Bowling Green some trouble last year at home, but I don't know what it is, but Something about that Ball State team just doesn't seem the same seem as what right. they were last year. And I think it comes down to the fact that their starting quarterback from last year who ran that RPO offense that Mike New has to really perfection and Kyle Kelly plays DB now. Oh, jeez. So, okay. Hey, and it's just uh, tangential. We're talking about Toledo. Again, another shout-out to Scott Luffler. He made the rivalry relevant again. Yeah. You know, well, before he came came here during the, the Mike Jinks era, it, it was a joke. Right, I mean, and but you know, he pulled off that famous twenty-four to seven win. You know, he had he kind of got his bacon pulled out of the fire two years ago, but it's a win. And despite the fact that they think we obviously let last year go, we're not playing Toledo, holding our breath, saying, "Can we be competitive?" We're more like, "Can we?" Yeah. You know, what, what's it going to take to win this game? The last time that the battle of I seventy-five was a blowout was my freshman year three years ago, and that was. I mean that was tough to watch. I 
it, it was cold. Um, right. sh- shocking. I know it was cold in November in uh, Northwest Ohio, but <laughs> that game was hard to watch. Yeah. And then you come out the year after, and that was an instant classic. And then last year, that was an instant classic. I think we're back to the point where the Battle of I-75 is a top. Is it is it bold to say that the Battle of I-75 is a top 15, 20 rivalry in college football? Oh, I think 100%. Absolutely. I, yeah. I so it definitely is. Is it the best rivalry no. in the state of Ohio when talking about like other Ohio colleges? Oh, so like yes. Ohio. So yeah, Ak- absolutely. So Akron and Kent State, you know, Miami, yeah, OU. You, Miami, Cincinnati. Uh, Miami, Cincinnati. Uh, yeah, uh, Ak- Akron, Kent, probably two, but BG. BG, BG Kent? Kent. Yeah. one. Wagon Wheel. Yeah, wagon, really, wagon Wheel's nothing. Battle of the Bricks is nothing. Uh, Cincinnati, oh, Miami is nothing. Miami is just out of the bars. But yeah, well. The Wagon Wheel one's been around for a yeah. while, but it – Nothing. It doesn't really compare to I seventy five. I agree. I think I think that's the premier interstate rivalry for sure, and definitely the best one in the MAC. Well, and it's it's just so close. Yeah, yeah. I don't proximity. think any other any other ones like a as large of a house name than that battle of I seventy five too. Yeah, yeah, I th- for sure. So, uh, okay, so let's just really quick since we're this is homecoming week. I just want to recap every. It's a very exciting week. Men's soccer. Tuesday and Friday, Henry Koss was calling it two victories. Volleyball opens up a very difficult Mid-American Conference schedule at Ball State Friday and Saturday. You heard Chaz McNeil here. We will have all of that action here on WBGU Live. Women's soccer Thursday and Sunday. And again, uh, you know, we're, we're, we've got a lot going on there. Um, women's tennis and swimming are having alumni events this weekend, so they're going to start getting cooking. Men's golf has an intercollegiate tournament. They're coming off um, their first win. And our own Reese Patrikas, 4.30 Saturday on Falcon Radio as we host Old Dominion on Saturday. And um, I will tell you, there, there's there's no reason not to wear your orange and brown this week. There's no reason not to catch at least one, multiple events uh, athletically, and um, you've got some great restaurant recommendations here from the crew. Uh, it's going to be just such a great week. All of that activity, if it's not on WBG, if it's not on Falcon Radio, it'll be on bgfalconmedia.com. And I encourage you to follow us on social media at BG Falcon Media on Twitter X, on Facebook and on Instagram. And for those in-game updates, uh, follow BG underscore FMSN on Twitter X. A lot going on, and we're excited to be a part of it. Thanks for spending part of your Sunday afternoon and evening with us. This is the Zig Zone on WBGU 88.1 FM. This broadcast has been a Falcon Media Sports Network production. For more BGSU sports news and updates, follow Falcon Media Sports Network on Twitter X at BG underscore FMSN, BG Falcon Media on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube, and head over to BGFalconMedia.com. Okay.